The Mother series spans 30 years, yet just three games. The first in the series, Mother, was released for the Famicom in 1989, being a JRPG that took a lot of inspiration from Dragon Quest, but with a twist of existing in a modern contemporary setting, as opposed to a fantasy setting which was the norm for the time. Mother, however, was never released outside of Japan until a global release for the Wii U eShop in 2015, where it was titled Earthbound Beginnings. The next title was Mother 2, which released in Japan in 1994 for the Super Famicom, and in the US in 1995 for the SNES under the name Earthbound. Much like Mother 1, Earthbound never made it far out of Japan, releasing in the US but not other markets like Europe or Australia, once again until a Nintendo eShop release later down the road. The third and final game, Mother 3, arrived on April 20th of 2006 in Japan for the Game Boy Advance and it still hasn't made its way outside of Japan, even 13 years later. But despite the erratic releases and lack of support for international versions, the series has still developed an incredibly passionate fanbase outside of Japan. One of the biggest reasons the Mother series has stayed so beloved is that there really isn't anything like it. There have certainly been titles very inspired by the Mother games, like the Lisa series or Undertale, but there still isn't anything that quite scratches the same itch. This is partly because of the unique choice and setting, as mentioned earlier, but it's also the self-awareness, humour and general absurdity of the series. For example, you mostly fight everyday objects like fire hydrants, taxis and sentient piles of vomit, not fantastical creatures, for the most part anyway. Plot progression will often happen apropos of nothing being so blatantly coincidental that you find it hard to blame the game because you know that it knows how ridiculous this all is. There's also a very distinct tone of voice and writing, characters often feel like a genuine product of the really strange world that they exist in, often to a point that it's hard to separate the world from its inhabitants. It's so strange that it makes the world and characters more believable, because surely only people from a mother game would talk like this. So who's the brainchild behind the mother series? A series of games so distinct yet streamlined and consistent must be helmed by someone just as interesting, right? Well, let's get into it. Shigesato Itoi was born in 1948 in a Japanese town called Meibashi. Itoi's parents divorced early in his life and as a result he no longer saw his mother and rarely saw his father, thanks to his busy work life as a legal advisor. After high school, Itoi enrolled at Hosei University in Tokyo but ended up dropping out. He soon felt that he had no plan for his future and so he wanted to find a job. This led him back to school, where he pursued copywriting. He found success in this industry, carving out a career for himself, writing for TV advertisements, bands, and even log lines for multiple Studio Ghibli films. Itoi eventually moved on from copywriting, instead moving on to writing proper. In 1981, he co-authored a collection of short stories with Haruki Murakami, a Japanese writer known worldwide for his works. Itoi had a unique, strange, and slightly unsettling style of writing. However, his catalogue is made up mostly of essays, covering a wide range of topics from his dog to economics. Itoi has also ran a personal blog, for lack of a better term, since 1998, called Hobonekani Toi Shinbun, translated to Itoi's Almost Daily News. He constantly updates the site to this day, making posts about whichever topic he feels, and is yet to go a day without posting despite the name. There's also no advertisements, instead making revenue through an online store, where you can buy clothes, books, food and jewellery among other things. Although this may seem all appropriately strange, the page is very popular, being able to support Itoi in an office of around 40 employees. Looking back on Shigesato Itoi's work, you can certainly see the DNA of the Mother series. A focus on subversion, community, family and connection is weaved throughout his history. All his past experience would end up manifesting itself in the Mother series. Itoi had been interested in games and so wrote a proposal and pitched it to Nintendo through some connections he had. Miyamoto wasn't sure at first as Itoi had become somewhat of a celebrity in Japan and Miyamoto felt that games by celebrities weren't very good. Despite this initial reaction, Itoi was called back by Nintendo the next day, who said that if he was serious, they were ready to get the project started. So what's Mother 1 actually like? Mother 1 was an interesting title for the time. As I mentioned earlier, it used a modern setting, but it also had you using toy guns and baseball bats for weapons instead of swords and shields. It exists in a strange middle ground between parody and admiration. Mother purposely avoids the cliches that already existed in the genre, 
while also creating a core gameplay loop that's so inspired by Dragon Quest it's hard to think they weren't big fans of the series. Mother follows Ninten along with Lloyd, Anna and Teddy as they explore the world to look for eight melodies of a song, after Ninten is tasked to find the melodies by Queen Mary, the ruler of a place called Magikant. Ninten was warped to Magikant after his father explains that his great-grandfather had psychic powers and... You know what, I'll keep the plot summary brief. A good chunk of it is reused for Mother 2 anyway. <coughs> Mother follows Ninten, along with Lloyd, Anna and Teddy as they explore the world to look for 8 melodies. As the player looks for the melodies, they'll fight random battles using a rather standard battle system. You have physical attacks, single use items and PSI attacks which are essentially magic. Mother 1 certainly has its fans, but it's not looked back on nearly as fondly as the latter two titles are. The game goes through a few large spikes in difficulty, which results in having to grind. And although the setting is unique, there isn't too much to see outside of the main plot. I'm sure some fans enjoy the challenge and feel like the world is expressive enough without the need of too many details provided outside the plot, but it's ultimately a game that the industry is aged out of. JRPGs hadn't been around long enough to become as streamlined as they are these days. Although Mother 1 hasn't held up too well, it's still an important title. It was subversive and different and it laid the groundwork for Mother 2 or Earthbound. So who knows, maybe without Mother 1, Earthbound never would have been as fantastic as it was, and still is. Earthbound would also sit itself down in this weird middle ground right next to Mother 1. It is very much a sequel to the first game, exploring similar concepts in more depth, while also adding new elements and mechanics. The game didn't sell very well in the US, being backed by a... strange marketing scheme. This meant that the game never really took off outside of Japan until it retrospectively became one of the most loved titles on the SNES, along with a dedicated cult following, as mentioned earlier. So Earthbound now occupies a strange space, where it is adored by those who've played it and only really known by those who haven't because of that kid who's in Super Smash Bros. The game has you controlling Ness, a child from a town called... On it? Want? Okay, so is it On it or Want? Because everyone calls it On it, but the next three towns in the game are Tucson, Threed, and Foreside. So if On it begins this number-based naming scheme, shouldn't it actually be pronounced Want? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think, I think that's right. No, I'm definitely right. The game has you controlling a child called Ness, from a town called Want in a country named Eagle Land, which I believe was the name for the beta version of America? One night, a meteor falls in the town and Ness and his neighbor Pokey go look at the crash site. Ness is told by a bee-like alien named Buzz Buzz that he must find the eight melodies of a song at eight different sanctuaries around Eagle Land to stop Gygus. Along the way, he's joined by Paula and Jeff. Teddy was unable to make filming days and so he was recast and played by another Earthbound resident, Pooh. One of the most important changes between the first and second game comes from the battle system. When a member of your party is hit with an attack, the damage isn't immediately decided and subtracted from the character's HP. Instead, the HP ticks down in real time, meaning that if you're quick enough, you can heal that character before all the damage is subtracted from their health, letting you negate a certain amount of it, or in some cases, avoid death altogether. This new mechanic helps set it apart from other titles and feel like a unique battle system, and adds some great tension to encounters. Inventory management has also been streamlined. You can call Escargo Express, who will store items for you though only three can be deposited at once, making the process frustrating and likely leaving you wondering why the inventory is so limited in the first place. Where Earthbound benefits from its evolutions the most though is in its writing. You'll find a lot of memorable characters throughout the game. Earthbound and its characters are just really random and absurd. And not random in the attention-seeking mid-2000s teenager random, but genuinely subversive and entertaining. One character will be celebrating because their wife left them for the second time, and another will be surprised that you can't foresee the collapse of capitalism. <laughs> I think part of what elevates these characters is that most of them show up once and say one or two things. From the weirdos to the comrades, you don't know what to expect because every text box is distinct from the last. Okay, so intro to Mother series, check. Uh, talking about Shika Sato Itoi, check. Covering Mother 1, uh, I've done that. Covering Earthbound, done that. Okay, so. We're all caught up on context, which means we can finally go over the game this video is actually about, right? Right? 
wait, wait, wait. Why does the script have an ellipsis there? We've been going on for like minutes. Surely we can talk about the actual game now. Hey, hey, s stop fading out. An answer me. How are you even doing? Are you editing the video live? What the fuck? So you may have noticed that Mother 3 released 12 years after Earthbound and arrived on the Game Boy Advance instead of a home console. The development process stopped and started throughout the 12 years, but the setting and overall feel of the game seems to have stayed mostly consistent, at least that's what it seems from the small amount of available footage. Mother 2 had sold well in Japan, meaning that a sequel was quickly approved, with development being started immediately. The team was impressed by 3D games on the Nintendo 64 and so wanted to transition the Mother series into the third dimension with the next title. It was quickly found out, however, that the game would be too demanding for the standard N64 hardware, which resulted in a scaling back of the game's scope and a hardware change, now developing the game for the Nintendo 64 disk drive. This move would historically go on to suit the Mother series well as the N64 disk drive never released outside of Japan. So after the commercial failure of the DD, Mother 3 was made a cartridge-based N64 title. Mother 3 was announced to be coming to the US under the incredibly original title of Earthbound 64. At Space World 1999, a playable version of the game was displayed, and here we can see Mother 3 was already focused around the same family, and the exploration of conflicts found at the intersection of nature and technology were present, as can be seen with the chimera shown and the logo at the beginning which mixes metal slate and trees. In a discussion about the cancellation of the game between Shigesato Itoi, Satoru Iwata, and Shigeru Miyamoto, Iwata said that the game, in a general sense, was around 30% done overall. The cancellation was due to the lack of focus and experienced staff Nintendo were able to lend to the game as the GameCube's launch was approaching. Three years later, however, on April 14th of 2003, commercials for Mother 1 Plus 2 began to air in Japan. Mother 1 Plus 2 was a compilation of the first two titles being released for on the Game Boy Advance. The commercials were simple and to the point, but had something very interesting at the end. Game Boy Advance. Mother 3 was announced to be back in development, this time for the Game Boy Advance. Over the next two and a half years, it would be restated multiple times that the game was still in development, and in late January of 2006, both Itoi and Nintendo would announce the final release date of April 20th, 2006. In early February, just a couple months before release, Itoi opened World of Mother 3. World of Mother 3 was a website that would release new information about the game once a week leading up to the launch. Here Itoi shared things like screenshots, music tracks, general information about the game, and finally a letter from Shigesato Itoi himself where he urges players to really engage with the game in all its aspects. And oh, I intend to Mr. Itoi. Can't you see the length of this video? Just two days later the game would be released, to positive reviews and sales of around 370,000 copies by the end of 2006. In Japan anyway. There was no mention of Mother 3 getting any official translation, so in November of 2006 a team of fans started to translate the game themselves. The translation was led by Tomato, a professional translator who's worked on a number of popular series. A few others helped with ROM hacking and polishing of the script. On October 17th of 2008, the fan translation was released. It was downloaded over 100,000 times within the first few months, but this didn't convince Nintendo to release an official translation, so Mother 3 stays Japan exclusive 13 years later. I wanted to go over the history of the development and over the Mother series as a whole because this video is about all of Mother 3. So, although Mother 3 can't technically be played officially, that doesn't mean that it can't be played properly. In my two playthroughs of the game, I've never felt like I was playing a translated title. The writing has the same qualities of the Earthbound localization, with it being different where appropriate and reading very much like something Shigesato Itoi would write. And although it's a shame that Mother 3's development was so long, I'm personally glad that we got the game we did. I can't comment on Earthbound 64 as a game, but there are some things about it that make me happy it wasn't released. Although it was using this newfangled thing called the Third Dimension, whatever the fuck that is, the footage we have shows a game that hasn't aged nearly as well as Mother 3. The graphics were simple and lacked much style, even in comparison to other 3D JRPGs like Final Fantasy VII. 
which instead used pre-rendered backgrounds to retain the detail of high quality pixel work. On top of this, the Nintendo 64 was in no way the JRPG machine that the SNES was, and with Earthbound 64 already being scaled back to fit on a cartridge instead of a disc, who knows how compromised the final game may have been. With how great Mother 3 is, it's hard to look back on Earthbound 64 and want that instead. Holy shit, we actually get to talk about the game now. So just to preface, the rest of this video focuses purely on Mother 3 and my analysis of it. I've purposely avoided other analysis and interviews with a toy about the meaning of the game's narrative so that the points I make are my own. I may step into more speculative territory as I don't necessarily have concrete answers for everything, so just a heads up. Let's get into it. So you insert the totally legit Mother 3 Game Boy Advance cartridge that you definitely have. Ah, shit, let me just move that. And start up the game. As soon as you hit new game, you name each character of the central family. The father Flint, the mother Hanawa, and the two children, Klaus and Lucas. Along with Best Boy 2006 award winner, Boney the dog. You then ask what your favourite food is, and I put tacos, and then what your favourite thing is, and I put music. Though the canon answer for that second question is love. These two small questions return from Earthbound and will be mentioned by characters throughout the game and it just makes it feel a little more personal. The prologue begins in Hinawa's father's house. As Lucas, you hop out of bed and go outside to play with Klaus. This small prologue establishes so much of Mother 3, it's like a tiny microcosm of what the game is. It's tone, writing style, music, humour, emotion and compassion, all in one little section. It's all captured here in a number of different ways. The most obvious of these is the music. You're only five minutes in and you've already heard like two or three bumpin' songs. The versatility of the soundtrack is shown here too, from energetic fun and crunchy songs to easy listening, laid back tracks that will have you humming along by the second or third loop. Next is the visual style. It looks similar to Earthbound although with a little more detail and utilising completely different environments and locales. The graphical style complements the game really well, cooperating with its different elements. The simplicity and warm, optimistic colours make the genuine emotional moments more touching. It's like an extra layer of sweetness and innocence on top. On the other hand, this simplicity allows Mother 3 to subvert your expectations more effectively, as the visual style has disarmed you a bit. So once you walk Lucas outside of Alex's place, you'll find yourself in a secluded, peaceful area where the house is tucked away and surrounded by wildlife, as opposed to the American-like town that Earthbound had you starting in. As you walk around this area, you will quickly see the value in talking to everything. The chickens, pigs and cows that Alec owns all have something to say. Even if it is just small quips that communicate the quirks of the writing in the game, it has a deeper value. By making these unimportant animals characters that you can actually talk to, it teaches you to see what everyone has to say. After all, if these animals all have their own dialogue, then the human characters must have something interesting to say as well. Thanks to this small lesson, the game doesn't have to force characters upon you. When you get to Tasmili, the main town of the game, you're more likely to go out of your way and speak to people, which makes characterization more natural and unobtrusive. Once you decide to go see Klaus, you will most likely try the first path you see, which is straight down. Here you'll encounter the blatant ways in which the game will forbid you from going somewhere. As you go to walk down, you're stopped as there are ants at your feet, and you wouldn't want to step on them, even though you can't see them. This introduces the self-awareness the game has as well. 
it knows this is a bullshit reason for Lucas to stop himself, but it's such a bullshit reason that you're more likely to chuckle to yourself than get frustrated. As a player, you now understand the game's positioning when it comes to directing you, so when it happens while you're more invested in the story and exploration, you probably won't be that mad because it's expected and already established. As you try another path to the right, you encounter the most important character in the game. A save frog. The frog explains that you should preserve your memory so you don't forget them, or in other words, save your game. These frogs save your progress but also play into another really important part of Mother 3, which is the characterization of boring but essential mechanics. This is only something that happens a couple of times, but it speaks to the game's commitment to being anything but uninteresting or forgettable. Saving is something that you have to do in practically every game, so it becomes something that is standard and repetitive but necessary. So by turning the save point into a character, you forge a more concrete connection with it. You don't breathe a sigh of relief just because you see a new place to save, but also because you see this character. Saving now has a personality and lines of dialogue, and the relationship that players have with saving can be used to make you care about a character, and as silly as it sounds, you will care about these good green boys by the end of the game. Continuing down this path, you will see Klaus ramming himself against a Drago, or as I like to call it, a dinosaur. Get it? <laughs> it looks like a dinosaur, but it isn't. Okay, I'm sorry. So despite the fact that Klaus appears to be writing a new word of his death wish with each step, he's actually just playing with them because they're peaceful creatures. Once again, something crucial is being established here. You're being shown that the Nowhere Islands are truly peaceful, even creatures that the player would assume to be violent and dangerous coexist with humans. The islands are an ecosystem in complete balance. Alec then teaches you how to dash and... Oh my, it's beautiful. You don't need to use a consumable item to travel faster for like 10 seconds. It, it makes me emotional just talking about it. <clears throat> okay. Suddenly a mole cricket runs in. And yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a cricket that burrows underground like a mole. The mole cricket is very confident it can defeat Lucas and Klaus and so you're thrust into your first battle of the game. And then the battle quickly ends after about 20 seconds. <laughs> In this battle, you'll become more familiar with the UI and navigation as well as the general rhythm and combat system. It's a simple turn-based system that lets you attack, use items, run, and guard. Guarding makes the returning HP tick a scroll by slower, giving you more time to heal the wounded character. Like I said, this prologue is a small microcosm, so you don't quite explore the battle system fully. After playing, Lucas, Klaus, and Hanawa get ready to go back home, with Hanawa sending a letter to Flint via Carrier Pigeon. Seeing a carrier pigeon being used to send a letter draws attention to the fact that you've seen no modern technology thus far. No TV, phones, cars, really anything that made the setting of Earthbound unique. This does a great job of making the player associate the serenity of the Nowhere Islands with a lack of technology and industrialization. As Hinawa sends the pigeon off, a strange song bleeds in and something flies overhead. This thing is making a sort of electronic warbling noise. The sounds and theme it produces feel unnatural and in complete contrast to the tone and feel established in the last 15 minutes. Hinawa looks up at this strange thing and wonders what it is, but all the player sees is the shadow it casts on the ground. The screen fades to black and the title screen is shown. This placement is deliberate and fitting. The game is indicating that this struggle between perceived progress and coexistence will be central to the game. The theme just heard plays over the title screen, and the drums boom and the horns blare. It feels grandiose, like it's being played by a marching band, something that needs numbers and cooperation to truly succeed. Though the track seems to lack the soul and character that true teamwork instills. It's much too out of fear and obligation.
We then see a forest echoing with explosions and catch a few glimpses of people dressed in pig costumes called pig masks who are setting the explosions off. The music is immediate, persistent and intrusive. The forest is alight and people in the nearest town, called Tasmili, are panicking and rushing around trying to figure out what they can do. The wildlife of the forest is shown too. The animals are attempting to escape. This act isn't one purely about humans, but the ecosystem as a whole. Then the first chapter is introduced. The title is foreboding and kind of grim, and so far there's only a few named characters that you know of. A man named Thomas races down the road to Flint's house, knocking furiously on the door and urgently calling for him. You're then put in control of Flint inside his house at Tasmili. You're the only one there, so it must be the night that Hanawa and the kids were supposed to get back. Thomas is frantically trying to get in and he wonders why anyone would lock their door in such a peaceful town. In his attempts to get in, the doorknob flies off, but Flint quickly walks outside. Thomas then says, Ah, doorknob, I mean, Flint. This is no time to be dozing off. There's a huge fire in the Sunshine Forest. This is a great example of how a toy's writing finds itself being funny while still retaining the appropriate tone in a serious moment. The fire is serious, it's treated with dramatic weight, but including Thomas's slip up of calling Flint doorknob, it puts a little smile on your face. It also makes sense because Thomas is panicked and is likely running off adrenaline. As you run through the town towards the forest, you can talk to many of the people of Tasmili. Some are just as panicked as Thomas, some are scared, and some are still finding a way to gossip about another citizen, even at a time like this, Jill. Now's not the time for shit talking, Jill! You get a few lines from everyone here. The majority have a touch of humour in them, but they all have distinct character. They don't feel like NPCs of a town that you talk to in the hopes of getting an item or a new side quest. The things they have to say are relevant, and as you progress, you'll become interested to see what each person thinks about whatever is currently going on. Flynn continues to the forest to look for Fuel and Lyda, who live there. As you rush through the forest, you encounter a number of enemies, letting you get a hang of the battle system. These first sections let you get acclimated nicely. The battles are simple and quite easy, so you can get used to the rhythm of combat and explore the more unique aspects of the system, like the special moves that Flint has, and the rolling HP meter. You can also find ample healing items, with a healing hot spring being nearby. This simple introduction to battling is really important. Repeated victories give a sense of accomplishment, and weak enemies let you experiment with their special moves without too much punishment. And on top of that, the steady progression through the forest keeps the narrative pace consistent and believable. The Sunshine Forest is a fantastic little tutorial dungeon, one caked in characterization and narrative importance. Deeper into the forest, Flint and Thomas see one of these pig masks as they release a few strange looking bugs. In this area you fight sweet potatoes, yes, actually, an indication that this interference is turning the previously coexisting members of this ecosystem against each other. Another nice detail is the thematic threads that cross over into the battle. The battles in Mother Games, as I'm sure you've noticed so far, have strange psychedelic backgrounds, often made up of shapes and patterns of various colours that are distorting or moving in strange ways. These backgrounds match the world really well. For example, the backgrounds during the fire in the Sunshine Forest are made up of reds and oranges. They pulse and move, constantly changing form, much like fire itself. This method of placing battles within the world is more theoretical and abstract, allowing it to be experimented with. It also makes the truly strange and surreal moments much more subtle, as you've become accustomed to this weird imagery. This change in presentation isn't different for the sake of it, it's regularly justified and used in interesting ways. You soon come across Lyda, lying on the ground. He mentioned that Fuel's still at home, deeper in the forest. Flint goes to find Fuel, while Thomas gets the injured Lyda back to safety. You fight off what you find out are called Fireflies, continuing the punny names of almost every enemy in the game, soon finding Fuel in Lyda's house. You barge into the home, discovering and battling a flying mouse. It looks unnatural with small wings that seem to have come off a bug of some sort. It seems that the fire isn't the only thing interrupting the forest's ecosystem. After the fire, you save fuel, with the house crumbling around both of you as you exit. Flint and Fuel make their way back through the forest, exiting and seeing a group of villagers around Lyda, who's bandaged up and lying on a table. Fuel runs over to his father, worried about him. This moment is presented as being as genuine as possible, which is for the better. A game that is so consistently absurd and funny could easily become afraid of being this genuine, worried that it seems hokey or corny. 
but Mother 3's fearlessness in this regard is one of its strongest traits. Constant jokes could make you feel like this world exists purely to be laughed at, so balancing this out with character development and serious writing helps the bonds you form with these characters deepen. In fact, what can make these emotional moments so effective is how corny it is. A town that is purely innocent and peaceful sounds sickeningly sweet, but breaking this peace so soon into the game stops it from getting to that point. This means that as you go through the first few hours, the idea of a purely peaceful world doesn't seem so far-fetched. You've seen how these characters help and care for each other, so maybe peace could be achieved by this group of people. This moment between lighter and fuel is a culmination of all these aspects. It is optimistic and hopeful in the face of tragedy, humorous but emotionally touching. It's all just very human in a good way. Miraculously, it starts pouring with rain, putting out the fire in the Sunshine Forest. Flint and a few others take Lida back to the local inn. Outside the inn, Isaac asks Flint if he's seen Hanawa and the kids. He then mentions that he saw Hanawa while up in the mountains, later hearing what sounded like the Jago's roar. Flint runs home, seeing the pigeon Hanawa left a message with earlier. He reads the letter, seemingly unable to take his eyes off it. Isaac walks in on Flint still reading the letter, remarking that they're still not back. He leaves to gather the rest of Tasmili so they can all look for Hinawa, Klaus, and Lucas. Playing as Flint, you go to find the family with the dog Boney tagging along. Again, you can see what each resident of Tasmili has to say and get an idea of how they're feeling about the current situation. What's especially sharp about this part of the game is the way that it shifts focus so naturally. Establishing who the family are before you play as Flint, and then peppering in moments of them as you look for fuel in the forest, makes the quick shift from the fire to looking for your family feel justified. It also disguises what is really a very sudden change in objective quite well. This transition is further smoothed out by having you go through the forest again, seeing how it has changed from the fire. It's certainly the same place, but the atmosphere is dour and gloomy instead of hectic. It feels different. The catalyst for all of this change is essentially a shift in weather. The sudden downpour is used to great effect, being where the mood slows, the music smooths out, and focus shifts from a panicked town trying to avert a crisis to an exhausted community that is desperately, yet slowly, looking for some of their peers. You no longer move with purpose, but with hope. These things work in tandem to make the player buy into this community and town, and are executed within just a few seconds and some sudden rain. This is an example of why I pray to Shigesato a toy at night. I mean, it's so effective and so efficient that you don't even notice how radically things have changed until you're deep into the forest. It sucks you in so much that these changes aren't jarring, but engaging. You're done with the fire, now you need to find your family. Deep into the forest, progress in the search is halted by trees blocking the way, with some claw marks nearby. Bronson, the town's blacksmith, along with Isaac, Lyda, and Fuel, start trying to move the trees and urge you to find another way around. You've seen the town unite to stop the fire, and here they're uniting again, but for you. Reinforcing the sense of community again and again throughout this first hour, make sure that the player understands the spirit of these people. Every player will know just how tight-knit Tasmili is. From every text box to every action, it all works to set up Tasmili as a town and as a community. While looking around, Boney sees a piece of red cloth tagged on a branch on top of a cliff in the forest. Wes, a citizen of the town, sends Boney to fetch Duster, his son, as he'll know how to scale the cliff. A cutscene of Boney searching for Duster plays here. I think it emphasizes how every member of the community is important, even the pets. A sleeping Duster is dragged through the forest by Boney, eventually waking up and rushing to the cliff. This small introduction to Duster sets up his character really, really well. Him sleeping at such an important time makes him seem a bit clueless, but if he's given the chance, he rushes to do what he can. He sprints to the cliff to get there. He does all of this despite his limp, which makes contributing in these crucial circumstances more complicated. It's a really fast way of communicating who Duster is, and makes his arc all that more believable and likeable. So Duster uses one of his thief tools, wall staples, to craft an easy to climb ladder up the cliff face. It's important to note that Duster mentions that this is the first time he's used this tool, despite learning it as a child. This really small section establishes Duster well, reaffirms the peace Tasmili existed in, and also communicates to the player which situations the wall staples are used in, as they will be utilized throughout the game. Mother 3 constantly has sections like this, a few minutes of gameplay that will do so much for the plot, gameplay, and character progression. Duster then joins the party, and the three of you climb the wall staples up the cliff. Once you've reached the top, 
the rain stops. The mood is shifting once again. At the top of the cliff, you see two of the same pig cosplayers from the forest. They have some animal machine hybrid on top of a strange looking device. As you approach, the pig zap this thing to life and it attacks. You're fighting a reconstructed caribou, a grotesque mix of machine and animal. It has hydraulic legs and an antler that is spitting steam like an exhaust pipe. This is the first boss of the game and provides a good opportunity to make use of Duster's skills. Each character you play as in Mother 3 has skills specific to them. They're mostly quite useful and help each character fill a particular role during battles. Duster's skills are related to his expertise as a thief. He has the previously seen wall staples which pin enemies to the ground, stopping them from attacking for a couple turns. He also has tools to lower enemies' offense and defense, as well as a pendulum that puts enemies to sleep, just to name a few. What's great about these is that they not only make each character feel distinct in battle, but reinforces their characterization. Duster is a thief, so he has tools that disarm enemies, but they're only now being put to use by him, so tools like the wall staples and hypnosis pendulum will regularly miss. So now you're in a fight that's lengthier and can justify using turns to purely buff or debuff characters. You're provided the perfect opportunity to experiment with Duster's abilities right as he joins the party. The placement of this boss makes narrative sense as well. Earlier we saw the mouse with wings, a strange enemy but not one that flies in the face of natural evolution, when it comes to a mother game anyway. In that same forest you're fighting sweet potatoes, so strange enemies aren't that unlikely. However, this chimera is a clear distortion of a natural being. Fighting this enemy here with the pigs present clues us in that they probably weren't responsible for just the fire. After defeating the caribou, the pigs run off, in their haste leaving a notebook behind. The notebook mentions that the pigmas and its leader are going to make rougher and tougher animals. It's written childishly like this decision to destroy all these animals was a flippant one. Flint and the others chase after the pigs and we see them take off in a spaceship like vehicle with the same song we heard at the title screen. It seems that these pig masks are the ones marching to this theme. There's no way forward, so you head back down the cliff to see if the trees have been moved yet. As we get down, Janelle tells us that Lucas and Klaus have been found. A nice detail about this section is that the other villagers are the ones who find the kids. It once again shows us the way these people support each other, and it's a great way to show how tight-knit this community is, rather than just telling them. Flint rushes up ahead and enters a small clearing. The kids are huddled up before a fire, trying to warm themselves after being washed up at the river. Isaac, Lyder, and Fuel are here, along with a couple other townspeople. Flint, Klaus, and Lucas embrace, happy to be together again after such an exhausting night. After a little while, Bronson sprints into the clearing, calling for Flint. Bronson hesitantly explains that he found a Drago Fang that was pierced through Hanawa's heart, killing her. Lightning strikes. The weather is once again helping set the mood and tone. Seeing Flint lash out like this, you can't really blame him. 
He hasn't said a word the whole game, and it's finally become too much. This moment brilliantly humanizes him. He's been the savior all night, but he's not perfect. The people who helped find his children are now just witnesses to Flint's inability to save his own wife. Seeing characters trying to get through to him despite how obviously scared they are of him, it's a testament to the relationship they have with each other. We then see a flashback to the final moments Hinawa and Flint spent together, as the kids and Hinawa left for Alex's house. They don't share any words, they just stare at each other. Lucas has to physically drag Hinawa away. We can understand why Flint would be so angry at himself. The last thing he did was let her leave with the kids. He didn't get any closure. What's so impressive about this sequence is how expressive it is, visually, tonally, and musically. Most 2D RPGs on systems like the Game Boy Advance or SNES are very limited in how characters can animate. For example, in 2D Final Fantasy, surprise is expressed by having the character sprite jump up and down. There's a reliance on simple, exaggerated movements. Here though, Flint has a whole set of animations that are never seen again. The way he stands up from being on his knees, how he swings at the campfire, and the moment he can't bring himself to swing once again at Ollie. This level of detail to presentation makes every interaction between characters feel genuine, not like something that is pre-programmed into a game. The music is slow and plodding, the keys bounce back and forth, sounding bittersweet. They're mournful, and make Flint's actions seem tragic, not evil. This sequence is compassionate and understanding. It treats what is happening with respect, and in doing so elevates it to something that is genuinely moving and engaging. Flint wakes up in Tasmili's jail, and Bronson notes that no one has ever had to stay in there before. A few minutes after Bronson leaves, Klaus walks in with a very inconspicuous apple that has a brilliantly hidden hand file inside. He mentions how he's going to get stronger than even Drago's and promptly runs out. Using the hand file, Flynn escapes the jail, and outside Duster offers his condolences. At this point you can explore Tasmili and talk to all the residents, allowing you to touch base with them and get their perspective, continuing to build and develop the characters. What's valuable here is how different everyone's responses are to Hanawa's death. People will offer condolences in a number of different ways, speaking to their personality. Jackie is speechless, Betsy asks you to keep being a good father, and Abbott and Ollie forgive Flint for hitting them. These characters all help establish the general thoughtful reaction the town has while providing nuance in each text box. You can also visit some shops, turning nuts you may have picked up along the way into better healing items, or visiting Thomas's Bazaar where you can take what you need free of charge. Being able to accrue useful items at no cost to you helps the gameplay back up the assertion that Tasmili is peaceful, and makes the player's mechanical relationship to the town grow tighter. While visiting Hinawa's grave, you learn from Lucas that Klaus has run off to fight the Drago that killed Hinawa. After getting this news, Flint gets a weapon to fight the Drago with, and heads off to Alex's house. As you run back through the forest and beyond, you come across new enemies. Two notable enemies are the Greedy Mouse and Agitated Boar. These two represent the changes this environment and town are going through, or are about to go through, and they're a clever way of escalating combat while also giving some narrative importance to a part of RPGs that can often be thought of as a purely mechanical role. Another new enemy, this time in a new area near Alex's house, is the Crag Lizard. This lizard disguises itself as a rock in the overworld, only moving once you get very close. This is another good example of making enemies more than something you just battle. The Crag Lizard is a representation of the environment or ecosystem arming itself. It's a rock, or something inanimate, that has been weaponized to fight against intruders or humans. Alex says Klaus may be at one of his friend's houses, so you start to travel there. Along the way, Alec will interject with some information about this friend. He reveals that they're a Magipsy, a genderless being who's been protecting something for a very long time. He also mentions that there's more than one. Arriving at the Magipsy's house, you find six of them. You're introduced to Aeolia, Doria, Phrygia, Lydia, Mixolydia, and Ionia. We find out where Klaus was headed to as he came through the same area early on. You head north from the Magipsy's house, finding yourself in a cave swamp, I guess, if that's a thing. Alec guides you through it, and there's a funny bit where Alec interrupts with shitty puns and then gets self-conscious about Flint not laughing at them. This interjection of humour helps lift the mood a bit and also contrasts Flint's silence well. It stops the journey to find Klaus from being purely negative and tense, balancing the dynamic out well. While looking for Klaus, you come across one of his shoes, meaning he's likely close. A bit further ahead, you see the same machine that the Pigmas used to power up the Caribou Chimera. 
These two little breadcrumbs bring the game back to a serious tone quite well, along with the atmospheric, cloudy music. Flint and Alec soon find the other of Klaus's shoes, and a Drago Chimera walks out from behind a rock, attacking Flint, and thus beginning another boss battle. The battle is pretty intense, but still simple, which is the unfortunate reality for most of the early bosses as you haven't uncovered the complexities of the battle system yet, turning them into a simple heal when needed, attack all other times approach. Personally speaking, this doesn't bother me that much, as I'm not that into boss fights in the first place, but it can make the battle system seem shallow at the beginning. You use a Drago Fang to pierce the Mecha Drago's hide, allowing it to be damaged. Something I do like about this fight is that although Alec isn't controllable in this section, he'll sometimes automatically attack for pitiful amounts of damage, which plays into his character well. He's homely and sweet and old. Surprisingly, he's not made for fighting robot dinosaurs. The fight ends well too. Right before the Drago is defeated, it attacks one last time, doing almost 300 damage. As the battle ends right after, the HP ticker won't have got down to zero yet, but it does make what happens next more appropriate. After the battle, Alec, Flint and the Mecha Drago are all lying on the ground, wounded or hurt. The Drago tries to get up and keep fighting, but it can't hold its own weight. Flint then prepares to finish it off, but its child jumps out to shield it. He can't bring himself to attack and so he backs down. This interaction sets a precedent in the game's commentary on technology. It establishes that technological progress isn't necessarily a bad thing. This Drago still has a soul and a mind, and so killing it just because of its reliance or integration with technology would only be perpetuating violence. This sets the groundwork for the idea that technological evolution is only bad when put in the wrong hands or carried out under the pretense of unethical motives. It plants the seeds that will grow throughout the game to come to form a more coherent and thoughtful message. Once Flint backs away, the camera pans showing Klaus lying on a lower section of the cliff, not too far away. Perhaps this implies that Flint was so focused on revenge that he forgot what he was really looking for. Chapter 2 begins in Duster's house. Wes is giving Duster a mission to sneak into a Sohei castle to retrieve an item that Wes insists Duster will be able to identify. Wes himself hid this item while the king of a Sohei still lived in the castle, though the memory seems fuzzy. With this knowledge, you head off to the castle. On the way there, Duster comes across a strange man with a monkey and he's not anyone the player has seen before. You also run into Butch, a resident of Tazmili who was given money by this strange man though neither of them know what money actually is. However, Butch is convinced that it's something of value and hides it in the well at the center of town. You enter the graveyard on the way to the castle and have to fight off a group of zombies, which, when you think about it, is really fucked up because Duster probably knows all these people and he apparently just doesn't care. Anyway, you exit the graveyard and find that the drawbridge to the castle is not lowered, so you have to find another thiefier way in. As you go to leave back into the graveyard, you get one of the most important tutorials of the game, apropos of nothing. An ant randomly explains sound battles. 
You've probably seen throughout this video that sometimes during a physical attack I will hit multiple times, sometimes as high as 16. This is a sound battle. If you press the attack button along with the rhythm of the battle theme, you'll continue to attack with the subsequent hits doing varying amounts of damage, but mostly a fair bit weaker than the initial hit. These combos can be really useful though, at times doubling or even tripling the amount of damage you do. This is a cool way to keep standard attacks engaging instead of just watching everyone cycle through their turn. It also creates another decision to be made. If someone is hit for mortal damage, you want to avoid doing these combos so that this character gets healed as soon as possible. Most importantly though, it means that the game is filled with new battle themes. You're not tapping along to the same theme over and over. There's 58 battle themes in this game, and they're all catchy as hell. Sure, Final Fantasy IV's battle theme is amazing, but it will get old if you're playing for longer than an hour or two at a time. Mother 3 is almost never like that. You regularly get not only a new banger of a theme, but a new rhythm to figure out. Another part of this system is the sound cues you get when ripping through these combos. It's super satisfying and ties into the musical theme of battle really well. That being said, this combo system isn't a necessity. It helps, but you can still comfortably complete the game without utilizing it. This system brings battles alive and adds so much energy while making for more complex battles that have you making more decisions. Okay, so now that we got the completely random explanation of this incredibly important game mechanic, let's get back to the plot. After entering back into the graveyard, Duster finds a secret passage in the gravekeeper's shack which leads to the castle. After fighting some lobsters with Tims on, you come out the other side of the passage and inside the castle walls. Using some wall staples, Duster makes his way inside the castle on one of the upper floors. He explores the castle, fighting stinky ghosts and getting rotten eclairs from them. These rotten eclairs represent the inherent foul decadence that comes with commerce and capitalism, as the eclairs later on form a currency to be used within the castle and... Nah, I'm not that pretentious. I... I think. The castle is falling apart from neglect, it's from a long forgotten time. Also one of the gift boxes here just has a ghost that burps on you and cackles in your face about it. And that's why Mother 3 turned on 10 best game ever in While exploring the castle you come across a room filled with friendly ghosts who are some of my favourite NPCs in the game. One ghost is eating food that falls right through him, another sings a song about how you definitely shouldn't attach wall staples to the wall, and another ghost who sings along to this song while not knowing the words so it comes across as nonsense. Well, more nonsense than it already is. These ghosts are a great example of Itoi's efficiency in writing. Before this, the castle is pretty creepy, feeling lonely and generally abandoned. But these guys flip that around, making it feel lively and lived in. I think what gives the writing this power over mood is the consistency at which it subverts your expectations and in a conversational tone. You fight a bunch of ghosts, so seeing these friendly ones is surprising. Then one of the friendly ghosts is playing a piano and singing a song that tells you exactly what to do next to progress. And then another ghost is misinterpreting that song into something weirder. And it does this all by presenting these ghosts as normal characters. They don't feel like they exist to be funny, they are characters who happen to say funny things. Once scaling the wall thanks to the ghost's advice, you find yourself in a room with an impassable hole in the floor. To cross this gap you use a rope snake, which you brought from a ghost on the first floor with some eclairs. This rope snake isn't just an item but a character too with a pretty funny arc throughout the game. This continues the trend of turning mechanics into characters that I mentioned earlier with the save frogs. As Duster continues to explore, he sees a girl dash off down the hallway, dropping a pendant in the process. Duster picks up the pendant and goes on. He soon finds himself in a room where a ghost composer, called Mr. Passion, is bustling all the furniture in the room around in his fervor. 
When you refuse to listen to his music, he attacks, starting a boss fight. This fight is quite fun, having a much more dynamic energy now that you've been introduced to the sound battle system, along with the versatility of Duster's thief tools. The music here also shines, it has a lovely feel of progression and comboing along to it feels important, like you're making a real contribution to defeating them. Once he's beaten, Duster finds a room filled with nothing but a vase and some strange wall carvings. Duster grabs the vase and leaves the castle, heading back to his home. As it's morning, the people of Tasmilia are up and about, and you can talk to most of them. It's nice to get a new perspective on these characters as they talk to Duster differently than they did Flint. Everyone's a little bit shorter, Duster doesn't seem to be as respected as Flint is. Seeing these new sides of people only makes them seem more genuine, and isn't something you typically see in RPGs as you mostly play as a single character and are meant to embody them to an extent. There are a couple important things you can learn from some people at this point. Betsy, who works in the local Yaddo Inn, mentions that some strange man gave her money, and two children, Nicole and Richie, say they saw some creepy guy hit his monkey. This little bit of information tells us that the man Duster saw last night is making a considerable effort to change Tasmili, and probably for the worse. Duster makes his way back home. He shows Wes the vase, and then Wes yeets it into the ground, shattering it. He then goes on a tirade about how stupid Duster is, and suddenly you know why Duster was nervous of showing him in the first place. Duster then shows Wes the pendant he found, and Wes, shocked, mentions that the owner of the pendant may be the princess of Asohe Castle. With that information, he joins your party and you head back to the castle to search for the princess and the real treasure. When the two arrive at Asohe, they see some tanks belonging to the pig masks, who have been seen periodically so far. Just inside the castle, two of the pigs notice you and shock alive a creature made of clay which then attacks you. Much like Alec with Flint, you have no control over Wes, but he will contribute to battles. However, Wes isn't a fucking useless piece of bad joke making shit, but rather, uses effective items which do almost as much damage as Dutta himself. This helps Wes feel like a valuable member of the team, and positions him as genuinely skilled, as he's keeping up with Dusta despite being much older. By now it's been well established that the Pigmas are cowardly and weak when not backed up by objectively superior technology. The player understands that they have no integrity, and you'll have motivation to hate them because of what they've done to Tasmili with the fire and chimeras. As you enter the castle proper, you see that it's no longer ghosts haunting the place, but pigmas. You battle them for the first time here, and there's a few interesting things to note. They carry these laser guns that look almost like a child's toy version of a gun, but it does fire real bullets. The design is kind of generic and exaggerated, which is a goofy juxtaposition to the fact that it is a real gun. Another thing is that the pig masks themselves are pretty weak. They can dish out some firepower, but don't have a lot of HP. Also, the healing items you get from them are things like pork chips. Less nutritional, fattier, junk food, rather than the more home-style cooking items you've been using thus far, like bread and milk. In the return visit, Osehe is more dilapidated than previously. Suits of armor that used to be standing lay in pieces on the floor, the treads of the tank have ripped up the greenery outside the castle, and the friendly ghosts from earlier have all squeezed themselves into the kitchen. This not only makes for a cute visual gag and development of these characters, but shows us just how intrusive and careless the pigs are. I mean, even ghosts are weirded out by these freaks. Eventually you make it back to the room where the vase was, and Wes reveals that the strange carving is actually a door. Wes makes sure Duster turns around and then busts some sweet moves while repeatedly telling Duster not to turn around. Wes being presented as a very serious, skilled and precise thief and then doing this ridiculous dance along with the goofy music, it does a good job of warming him up to the player. It's also a good example of Mother 3's weirdness working because the absurdity is worked into the whole world, not just its writing. A dance as dumb as this needing to be performed to open this door is a rule within the world, and so to an extent grounds the strange writing and characters, making them feel consistent and believable. There's this sort of consistent logic to the game's absurdity that allows it to play itself straight as well. After Wes finishes the dance, the door opens and the two continue through it. In a stairwell not far past the door, we see the girl from earlier who dropped the pendant. She's been caught in a trap and Wes promptly helps her out of it. 
The girl who introduces herself as Kumitora and then joins the party. The wind, yeah, the general concept of wind, tells us that Kumitora knows PSI attacks, which are essentially magic moves. While continuing to fight through the castle, we encounter a few new enemies, including a floating broom that sweeps you a few floors down if you make contact with it, setting you like five minutes back for like no reason. I think this is supposed to make sure the player is using the dash function to dodge enemies, but that would have been way more useful in the first or second hour. Here is just frustrating, so much so that I used the very real rewind feature of my Game Boy Advance. Thanks Nintendo! As the three get closer to the treasure they're looking for, you'll likely see that Kumatora starts to feel feverish. This is a strange feature where characters who learn PSI moves will get feverish for a short period of time before learning a new move. This results in the character, and by extension the whole party, not being able to dash. I think the idea is that you don't just learn something new instantly, you have to go through the process of understanding it holistically, something which takes time. However, this little feature manifests as a semi-regular annoyance, not adding anything to the game and needlessly crippling the player's speed. Soon after, Dasta, Kumatora and Wes enter a room with the treasure in it. It's a strange item called the Egg of Light or Hummingbird Egg. Wes mentions that he doesn't even know what's in the egg, just that it holds secrets. You get the impression that he doesn't know why this item is important, just that it is. Kumatora expresses the same sentiment, speaking in vague terms about its importance. As they go to take the egg, a clay monster starts ramming the door. Kumator takes it, but is told by Wes that he placed traps around it, resulting in the floor falling from under them, conveniently letting them escape the pig masks. The three fall into a pool of water filled with... skulls? I don't like the implications of that. A shadow moves through the water under them, and you're thrown into a boss fight against the Oso oh Snake. Get it? Like a Sohei? <laughs> After the fight, the water suddenly starts escaping from one side, with the current pulling the party and the egg along with it. After a fade to black, we cut back to Tazmili where we see that Wes and Kumatora have washed up on the shore, with Duster nowhere to be seen. As the pair enter the town square, a crowd is gathered around Butch, who is furiously looking for Duster, thinking that he stole the money from the well. The other townspeople seem confused, as none of them even know what money is. After some arguing, Flint interjects, imploring everyone to calm down and just trust that Duster didn't steal the money, and that they should wait for him to get back. I like this appearance from Flint because it implies that he's grown a bit from Hanawa's death, as recent as it may be. He's trying to stay calm and keep the peace, instead of being emotional and lashing out, as he did earlier. After this interjection from Flint, Chapter 2 comes to a close. Chapter 3 begins with a group of pig masks, along with the strange man from earlier who we now know as Facade, torturing a monkey named Salsa after separating him from his girlfriend. Pig masks fly off in a large ship, leaving you as Salsa with just Facade. You're then ordered by him to find a white building further west in the desert, and so you do just that. Something you will immediately notice is how weak Salsa is only doing a few points of damage with a standard physical attack. This sets Chapter 3 up for a very interesting dynamic. Facade is a non-playable party member, attacking at random like Alec or Wes from earlier. The thing is, he's much, much stronger than you, to the point where you are relying on him in battles. This dynamic displays the power Facade has over you, making you dependent on someone who abuses you at any sign of descent. This is just another way the game ties combat to narrative really well. Facade is also established as a villain effectively too. He's not a nuanced villain at this part of the game, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. After building relationships with the people of Tazmili, and Salsa being a defenseless animal, 
the side becomes very easy to hate and builds motivation for the player to want to defeat him. You travel through the desert, saving a safe rug along the way and eventually coming to the white building. The building is actually an elevator, taking you to some underground tunnel. Mother 3 will often drastically switch environments with little transition, making for a world that can feel a little disjointed. What stops this from becoming a major problem though is the writing. The writing style of Mother 3 is so distinct that all the characters you meet make for environments that maybe don't make geographical sense, but do make tonal sense. The consistency here helps connect each area, making them feel a part of a larger world, not just self-contained. This lessens the sort of whiplash you would get from changing environments so suddenly. This is also helped by the chapter structure, as you often jump around to different characters and points in time, making changing locales feel less jarring. This new tunnel area is much more industrial than anything you've seen so far, and shows how the pigmas influence is spreading quite rapidly. Eventually you come to a pork bean, which is a hovering vehicle that you can use to get around quicker. Facade says, we're going to take it to an unbelievably uncivilized village called Tasmili. That's what Facade thinks of Tasmili, seeing the simple peace they lived in as lesser than the industrialization and commerce he will soon introduce. We also see an instant revitalizing device, a machine that instantly heals all health and PSI. This machine is the pig mask equivalent to the hot springs that do the same thing. These two methods of healing represent the clashing ideologies and forces well. The hot spring is natural, relaxing, and a more holistic experience, integrated well into its environment. The instant revitalizing device, however, is cold, mechanical, and clinical, but also efficient. It is a result of exploited labor, feeling only natural when surrounded by the cruel version of progress that the pig mask are trying to force upon the world. Climbing a ladder out of the tunnel, Facade and Solsa find themselves in Tasmili's graveyard. You make your way to the town square, along the way bumping into Duster, coinciding with his first trip to Osohe Castle from Chapter 2. Duster and Solsa share a moment, with Duster seemingly understanding that Solsa isn't there by his own free will. We then see that Facade was hiding behind the well when Butch hid the money there, implying that Facade was the one who stole the money. You go to Yaddo Inn to get a room for the night, and the owners seem confused that you'd have to pay a fee to stay. But despite this, Facade hands some money over anyway, attempting to begin integrating it into the community as a whole. The two go into their room, sleeping for the night. In the morning, Facade talks to the citizens of Tasmili about how the world is becoming more dangerous with each passing day, with new animals, vehicles soaring in the sky, and in the near future, powerful lightning strikes constantly. He then pitches his answer to these threats, claiming that true happiness can be achieved thanks to this one item. Only a few people take the offer, and it's your job as Salsa to deliver the item to these people. On delivery, you find out that this thing, called a happy box, is essentially a TV, though it's really a representation slash symbol of predatory technology. After delivering the happy boxes, you'll both have to rush to a Sohe castle because of some people interfering in the pigmas invasion of the area. Solsa and Facade go to the basement of the castle, passing through another secret entrance. You continue lower even still to a sewer-like area. You fight your way through some enemies, including this fellow who stares into your soul. After pulling a strange lever, the water begins rushing out, where Duster, Kumatora, Wes, and the Hummingbird Egg race past, being pulled by the current. As you leave the castle, you run into two pig masks with tanks blocking the way. Facade yells at them as they try to shift the blame onto each other, showing how childish and incompetent they are. It helps give a little clue as to how this group is being run, and the personalities it fosters. When reaching the town square, you see the same argument that chapter 2 ended on. Facade takes the opportunity to do some scaremongering, mentioning that Tasmili must be cursed. Salsa and Kumatora have a moment, indicating that Kumatora gets an impression of Salsa's predicament. They return to the Yaddo Inn and sleep for the night. In the middle of the night, Solsa is woken up by Kumatora's voice. Her and Wes have come to help Solsa escape. The three make it to the town square, stealing and destroying the shocker device as well. As they're about to leave to find Duster, Facade walks in with a group of pig masks. The three of them run off, with the pig masks giving chase. The group runs into the forest, fighting off the pig mass along the way. As you move further into the forest, the path is blocked by some pork tanks, with them quickly surrounding you. 
one lurches forward, and a boss fight begins. This fight has a really great sense of tension as it's much more visually imposing than previous opponents with its size and inhuman experience. You're also fighting a mechanical enemy, something you've not done too much of so far. The boss has some really cool moves as well. For example, it will vent its exhaust towards you, possibly making your characters cry. Crying is a status effect that may cause you to miss, by the way. It may not seem like much, but these moves, unique to different enemies and bosses, do a great job of keeping the fights entrenched in the world, having some sort of logic to them. They help create consistency in the world, making it more believable. This fight is pretty challenging, especially with Salsa being so weak and mostly relying on usable items. There's also a nice sense of progression, with the tank eventually beginning to smoke and the cannon sometimes jamming, causing one of its most powerful attacks to fail. The battle ends with a great feeling of satisfaction, only to be wiped away as Facade approaches with a group of pig masks and another pork tank. You've likely spent all your items as well as Kumatora's PP for PSI attacks and don't know how you'll win the next fight. Then suddenly, Lucas walks onto screen, followed shortly by some Dragos. I want to see my little boy. Here he comes. I want the adult Dragos eliminate some of the pig masks, with others running off. Seeing them get so scared after they just had you up against the ropes is really satisfying. This sequence also has some important character moments as we see Lucas take more control over his life after being debilitated by sadness from Hinawa's death. Also, Solskjaer is the one who directs the Drago to take Facade out, meaning you see him get revenge for how Facade has treated him. This sequence is just really cathartic, it's a great payoff for what you've seen so far. The Dragos then leave, with Wes recounting what's happened so far to Lucas. Kumatora and Salsa leave to search for Duster, with Wes and Lucas staying in Tasmili. With that, Chapter 3 ends. In between Chapter 3 and 4, we see a small compilation of flashbacks showing how Lucas has changed in the time since Nawa's death, setting us up to take control of him for Chapter 4. Chapter 4 begins with a train bolting by while lightning and thunder roars overhead. We learn that it's three years later and see Tasmili residents getting off the train at this new station. We then see how the town has changed. Houses are more private, there are police officers in the streets, and stoplights on the corners. All of a sudden, Tasmili looks much closer to a town that would be found in Earthbound. Facade's influence has clearly taken over the town. You wake up as Lucas, finally in control of the main boy like six hours into the game. After getting Boney to join the party, we learn about DP from a save frog. The frog explains that you now earn DP, or dragon power, and that this unit can be exchanged for goods or services. DP serves as currency and is earned from battling or selling items. You can withdraw or deposit DP from a save frog, and you lose some of the DP you're holding if you get a game over. That being said, you will likely never lose any money this way, as 99% of the time, there's a save frog right next to a shop. So you can easily circumvent this risk by withdrawing money, spending it at a shop, and immediately depositing the remaining DP. I'm not necessarily complaining, but it does make this whole system of withdrawing and depositing redundant. It's just a small thing that could have been changed to save some of the player's time. You'll also see a tourist marveling at Lucas's house, or as he calls it, the Lightning House. It seems that the home has been getting repeatedly struck by lightning, and that coincidentally, Lucas and Flint are one of the few people in town who don't own a happy box. It seems that Facade's prediction of lightning came true, but it's quite obvious that it's being artificially made and struck on those who haven't conformed. 
Happy boxes themselves seem to have some brain numbing effect. You'll see that people just can't seem to look away, and this engagement with the happy box has maybe become so ingrained in the town's culture that to not participate is to enact a sort of social isolation onto yourself. Turning the device into something that people feel they absolutely need if they want to fit in at Tasmilling. As you explore the town, more changes will become apparent. Thomas's store now charges for things, and his son runs it as Thomas himself now works at the factory. One of the farms has become a training ground for pig masks, with pigs filling the jail as well, and Mayor Pusher has become an even bigger piece of shit somehow. One of the most important things however is just how many people there are. These new people outnumber the Tasmili residents that you're familiar with, and none of them have any names. They're generic and unimportant. Talking to the residents you are familiar with however, gives you a good insight to what I think this game's stance on progress is. It's telling us that industrial and technological progress isn't inherently bad. I mean, Car Frog is a great example of that. But it can become deadly when this progress is sought after for the wrong reasons. Be that control, power, or profit. Neglecting to put people and their well-being at the heart of this strive for progress is how you create a future that is inhuman and uncaring. One that is unfair and most suited to those with access to the things that you instead prioritize to achieve that progress, creating a world that is built for the rich and powerful. Facade and the pig mass have come out of nowhere with a huge excess of resources and have been able to leverage this wealth to force a controlling, cruel progress on Tasmili, punishing dissent and nonconformity with violence and oppression, in this case raining lightning down onto people's houses for not owning happy boxes. They have become the de facto dictators of this town simply because they had more access and power for no legitimate, fair reason. I could certainly be projecting my own views here, but I believe this interpretation is one that's backed up consistently throughout the game, and we'll continue to look at it as we go. That being said, complete submission to the ruling class is totally worth it if it means we can have Car Frog and Old Man Frog. I mean, the car's so cute, and the Old Man Frog's accent is so cute. Eventually you will come to see Facade presenting to people in the town square again, though this time Wes interrupts, claiming he thinks Facade's behind the lightning. Facade responds calmly, putting on a facade of politeness. Wes is dragged away by a pig mask, speaking to the power Facade has and the willingness with which he exploits it. From talking with people, you will learn of a band called DCMC who play at Club Tidibu, yes that's how it's pronounced, for the factory workers. It's said that one of the band members looks like Duster, so you go and tell Wes. He asks you to see if it really is Duster. The train to and from the factory is no longer running for the day, so you walk down the train line to get there. While travelling down the line, you'll come into contact with some new chimeras, indicating that the creation of chimeras has continued to expand over time. The chimeras serve as great standard enemies as they fit into the familiar yet absurd setting of Mother 3. Taking two different animals and combining them into some abomination makes for some great visual gags, and each one has a punny name as well. It also makes for a pretty diverse group of monsters, with them all being so unique and at times being themed around the area you'll find them in. They also show how the pig mask power lets them bend nature to their will, seemingly not caring for the consequences or moral and ethical implications. About halfway down the train line you'll come across a hot spring. As you enter the hot spring you'll see Ionia, one of the gypsies you saw while playing as Flint. And then this happens. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this bit. The implications it's trying to draw and joke about are way too close to something completely disgusting that does happen in real life. It's not strange or funny, just inappropriate. 
I understand there may be some cultural differences at play here in terms of what's appropriate and what isn't, but this section is purely trying to laugh at the suggestiveness of it, not saying anything or trying to be more than a crash joke. It just doesn't land. And making one of them a gypsy is the character that does this? Yeah, the coding here is pretty gross. Anyway, after this process, Lucas learns how to use PSI, starting off with a move called PK blank. Well, not PK blank. The blank part is filled in with whatever you listed as your favourite thing at the beginning of the game. I'll refer to it as PK loves, as that's the canon name. There is one saving grace for this little part, however, and that is Magical Butterfly Frog. It's just adorable. Are you seeing a theme with the frogs so far? Soon after, Lucas and Boney make it to the factory and learn that to get into Club Tidiboo, they will need a pass earned by working at the factory itself. Earlier I mentioned how Mother 3 turns mechanical necessities into characters to make them more interesting in regards to the save frogs. We see that same thing here, but with inventory management. A complaint about Mother games has always been the limited inventory, and by extension, regular inventory management that has to be done. The friendly item guy mitigates this frustration to an extent. For no charge, you can deposit and withdraw items, and in my two playthroughs of the game, I've never reached the limit of what I can store. So he provides some mechanical relief to the player, and then as a character is endlessly positive about how well you're doing, stressing that you can do it, and so on. You don't see him in different forms like you do with the frogs, and he is not as frequent, making him less interesting and memorable than the save frogs, but it's still a good way to make this part of the game more interesting. At the factory you'll see a few familiar faces from Tasmili, as well as the clay monsters that you fought at Asohei Castle, now working around the factory. Inside you talk to a blue pig mask who mentions that you could do some part time work for the day to get tickets to Club Tidiboo. The pig mask also mentions that the club was built for factory workers, and that it's where they go to relax. This tells us that Facade and the pig mask have constructed a monopoly where workers have to work in the factory for DP, and then because of the exhaustion from work, visit Club Tidiboo to relax, where they likely spend DP. This system has been engineered to make labourers dependent on this one seller, keeping them in the ecosystem indefinitely. Unless some little kid and his dog come along to save the world. This situation isn't too unlike our world, which is full of oligopolies, markets dominated by a few sellers. For example, it can be very hard to look for entertainment without supporting Disney, and their pervasiveness within that industry makes it easy to become trapped like those factory workers from Tasmili. Once again, the imbalance of power is being manipulated to make the rich richer. Lucas agrees to work, and the pig mask asks something interesting. They say, Oh, and sign your name on this document. No, no. Not your name. I mean, you know, the name of, of the person in the background? The person pulling the strings. I guess you could say... What I mean to say is, the, the the player's name. This method of breaking the fourth wall is really interesting. The pig mask speaks with hesitation as though talking about something they completely know, but not knowing at all why they know it, or what it could possibly mean. It's like this strange middle ground of self-awareness that's really entertaining to watch. It kind of masks the fact that the game is randomly trying to get you to put your actual name in, not Lucas's, though it becomes relevant later. You're put to work moving powered down clay men up to the top floor to be re-energised. As the player you actually have to do the day's work, pushing the clay men around the factory to get them to the top. This part isn't very fun, but I think that's kind of the point. The work is monotonous, boring and without challenge. At the same time, it takes a bit to do, so you're sick of it by the end. This puts you in the mindset of these workers. You as the player are bored of the work, so going to Club Titty Boo is appealing. It sounds more exciting, and like a place where you can do something more interesting. So you can see why the club appeals to the workers. It's relaxing, different, and exciting. It's a nice way of putting you in their shoes, helping you get a more holistic view of how life under this quote-unquote progress is. You also get to catch up with some Tasmili residents, and a pig mask at the bottom mentions that the factory has a secret purpose. That is being used to uncover a dragon bigger than the Nowhere Islands. So this part does have some of the same Mother 3 weirdness. It's not all boring. You finish your work and clock off, earning a ticket to Club Tidiboo and 200 DP, which really isn't that much, especially after you subtract the expenses of the club. Also another bad thing about this place, they just hired a child with no hesitations. So that's really all the motivation you need to hate Facade. Not that he's been hard to hate so far anyway. Boney and Lucas take a rope way up a mountain where the club is located.
Once you arrive at the top of the mountain, there's this great sense of loneliness with the wind whipping its way over the surfaces of the rock and the music of the cub bleeding out of the walls, making you feel removed from everything. Being removed from that liveliness shows how it's easy to be drawn to. The lights, music, company, you can understand why the people of Tasmili have bought Facade's lies. Lucas and Boney are initially refused entry into the club, but are let in after a waitress named Violet vouches for them. Inside the club, you talk to Violet, who reveals herself to be Kumatora. She tells you to go and watch DCMC play their next song. Along the way, you see some flyers for an upcoming show, and one is a DCMC concert for King P. And a patron of the club says supposedly there's just one person running the world. You start to wonder if Facade isn't running the show after all. Right before the song starts, Kumatora asks you to hang around the lobby after the show. The performance begins, with the front man OJ mentioning that they're gonna play King P's theme. While the song plays, you notice that the bass player looks exactly like Duster, but with a wig on. Something remarkable about this performance is that it actually feels like these characters are performing. It doesn't look like some sprites bouncing around with some music laid on top. The song itself is super enjoyable, with every instrument making noticeable contributions while still coming together as a great whole. It shows this great sense of collaboration, the interplay of all these characters' strengths as musicians. This is certainly helped by the expressive animation and presentation, as touched on earlier. The concert ends and you exit the lobby, talking to Kumatora. She takes you through an underground passage which leads to her room. She and Lucas fill each other into what's been happening over the past three years. Kumatora then tells Boney and Lucas to go talk to the DCMC bass player, or Duster, to help jog his memory. The two go through the attic so as not to get caught. You fight your way through the area, taking on bugs and neglected instruments. All of this is done to a great track and has a nice sense of energy while seamlessly moving from frantic pace to an airy, smooth one. Eventually you make it to the boss of the attic, a bass that is very jealous because Duster doesn't play him anymore. Unfortunately, this boss is way too high level for this part of the game. In both my playthroughs of Mother 3, I was about level 15 once I reached this boss, but then had to grind to level 20 to make it bearable. I'm not alone on this either, videos on YouTube beating this boss are filled with people saying they were suddenly having a lot of trouble. But so far, Mother 3 has established itself as a game that you don't have to grind in. If you fight each battle you run into along the way without running too much, you'll be appropriately leveled for 95% of the game. So this section is a contradiction of how the game is balanced, making the player think that their strategy must be wrong, and not that they're just too low level. After beating the base, you jump down from the attic into Duster's room, where the rest of DCMC are, along with Kumatora. Duster, or Lucky as he now goes by, explains that he woke up with no memory, clutching a strange egg. He somehow knew it was important, so he hid it in a valley somewhere. Duster seems reluctant to go and find it with you, not even sure if he is Duster or not. He leaves it up to fate, meaning if you can beat all five band members in Scissors, Paper, Rock, he'll go with you. So you play against them, but every time you're put in a situation where you lose, the opponent will say something like, Ah, I went too late, let's do it over. It's hard to tell if the DCMC members know Duster should go with you, or if Destiny really is steering the game in your favour, giving you chances until you win. As you go to play against OJ, the band's leader, he tells you what he's going to play, throwing the match and letting you beat him. The band all say their goodbyes, and it's actually really sweet how sad they all are. You get the feeling they really do genuinely care for each other. Also, if you peek into the club from the lobby window, you can see the band playing a sad song, showing flashbacks of them helping Duster and making him a part of the band. I appreciate how sentimental it gets here, helping keep the balance in tone between humour and seriousness. Lucas, Boney, Kumatora and Duster leave the club in search of the hummingbird egg, ending chapter 4.
duster directs us towards the egg, one of the most important artifacts of the Nowhere Islands. So you turn around and look at this item box with the pretty fireworks inside. Then, after that incredibly essential task, you move on to find the egg. As you travel, you get to experience the battle system in more detail, finally having a full party of four to control. Each character fulfills a role really well, feeling essential to the team. Kumatora uses offensive PSI attacks, along with some buffs and debuffs, and maybe some healing if you're desperate. Duster uses his thief skills to debuff enemies and inflict status effects, as well as a strong physical attack. Boney can use his sniff ability to determine enemy weaknesses, and his high speed makes him good for using single-use items. Most importantly, Lucas is essentially the support of the team. He learns very few offensive PSI attacks, and his low speed makes physical attacks less viable, placing him in the role of buffing, healing, and providing shields for the rest of the team. The role he fills backs up his characterization. When Hinawa dies, his instinct wasn't to search for power and revenge like Klaus, it was to mourn and reflect, so it makes sense that his PSI powers would manifest as those that stop others from suffering or dying. He's trying to protect people not through violence, but through kindness. This is even cooler because it's a nicer version of the role that protagonists typically play, of being very offensively powerful. Having these mechanical through lines of characterization also helps the battles feel more tangible. Your character leveling up doesn't just symbolize their increasing physical power, but also mental and emotional power. PSI is a more mindful, emotional form of magic, so Lucas learning more healing PSI moves represents his growing resilience and empathy for his friends and the people he meets along the way. After traveling through the valley, you eventually see where Duster hid the egg inside a forgotten, powered down clayman. As he approaches, lightning strikes the clayman, jolting it to life and causing it to run away. Party chase after it, passing by the Tower of Thunder. You come to another factory and wander inside as it's the only way forward. The pigmas inside are aggressive at first, but become afraid after mistaking you for their commander. You're given a change of clothes, serving as a disguise and letting you move around the pigmas with no trouble. Just as you exit the factory, you see a garbage truck take off and you follow it in hopes of finding the clay man you're looking for. Along the way, some pigmas give you a pork bean to chase after the truck in, making exploring much easier. However, as you speed off, the pork bean slips on banana peels, even though it hovers. A pork trooper, the same one seen at Club Tittyboo, drives by, stopping to check if you're alright after mistaking you for the commander. He sees through the disguise, however, and you enter another boss fight. This fight is really fun as you finally get to face a boss with a full party. The music's great, the pork trooper is intimidating, and you now have enough hit points to make for a nice back and forth of being healed up and on the offensive and scrambling to keep everyone alive. After defeat, the pork trooper retreats, leaving his pork bean behind. At this point, you actually get the chance to explore a pretty large, open-ended area. It's a nice change of pace as the large majority of Mother 3 is quite linear, with very few side quests as your reward for exploring is usually an item box or a goofy character. With the pork bean you can explore this area efficiently, and there's some cute bonus stuff that rewards exploration well. One thing this area does do is draw to attention just how small the game is. Being about 10 hours in so far, you've really only explored Tasmili, repeatedly entering different areas within the town or surrounding environments. And even as you've gone to new locations, they're often very close to previous places. This may rub some people the wrong way, especially if you like the open-ended nature of RPGs, but I think Mother 3 is a testament to linearity and small worlds. Up to this point, I've mentioned again and again that you continue to revisit Tasmili after different events. This process is essential to Mother 3's identity, as it lets you learn about and connect with these characters, seeing them change and how their lives are being altered. You feel a part of this family and community precisely because you are repeatedly interacting with them. Mother 3 can get away with making new characters or text boxes the reward for exploration, because it's taught us that those things have value, whether that's because they're insightful, poignant, or just funny. I think this is one of the best ways that Mother 3 subverts RPG tropes, and it's what makes it so unique and memorable. Look at why people often connect the most with their party members in RPGs. It's because you spend more time with them and learn about who they are. And in Mother 3, every citizen of Tasmili is given that treatment to varying extents. 
The fact that Mother 3 makes a small, mostly linear world feel like it could be a back of the box feature is proof of the charm and talent with which the writing is executed. After exploring this area and coming across the grossest petrol station ever, a cow in line for the bathroom, and most importantly another frog car, you head to the northeast, finding the dump where the clay man is being dropped into. As Lucas and the others approach the egg, a clay man forms in front of them, being composed of other junk from the pile. It's time for another boss fight. What I love about this encounter is how it almost seems sad. This weird amalgamation of clay and garbage just looks wrong, like a clear violation of the rules of nature. The fact that this pile of what should be inanimate objects continues to attack and enact violence, even after its usefulness has been deemed over, it's kind of tragic. It's not clear if the claymen have any sort of consciousness, but if they do, it's obvious this is a cruel fate. After the fight, the hummingbird egg is retrieved. As Duster holds it, it begins emitting a bright light, causing him to regain his memory. We see a sweet moment of relief where Duster feels confident in who he is now that he has his memory back. The party is then taken to the Thunder Tower thanks to another pig mask mistaking Lucas for their commander. Exploring the Thunder Tower has this nice sense of tension. Walking amongst all these pig masks feels wrong and leaves you a bit on edge. Not to mention that the Thunder Tower is basically a monument to King P's immense power and the complete disregard they have for anyone but themselves. Its size combined with how lifeless it feels gives off this great sense of atmosphere. Loss feels kind of inevitable here and exploring it is an isolating experience. In the tower you get a better idea of the pig masks methods as well. You can see catfish that they are harvesting energy from, floating aimlessly in a small tank surrounded by watchful eyes that exist to exploit it. It's very clear that the pig masks interference and destruction of nature is a thread that runs throughout all their operations. The game does provide some commentary here though. We learn that the generators are malfunctioning, proving that this continued exploitation of the world and its resources is unsustainable. That perpetual growth is unviable and dangerous to everyone involved. You come across the pork trooper again here, blocking the ladder that leads further up the tower. Another fight against them begins. This encounter is pretty easy as you can use DCMC merchandise to stop him from attacking because he's a massive DCMC stan. After defeating the pork trooper, Facade shows up, hoping to take revenge after the Drago attack. The four escape up the ladder, leading to the scaffolding of the tower. The nice atmosphere continues here with only the metallic sounds of feet hitting the ground and the wind whistling as it passes over the massive structure. You simply make your way up the scaffolding, fighting some screws along the way. Eventually you climb another ladder, taking you into what looks to be a child's room, with toys littering the ground. There's also a hot spring along with a few of the bears you can buy as items in Earthbound. In the room you see a robot maid, protecting a yo-yo that looks like one that Nest from Earthbound could have used. If you approach the yo-yo, the maid, Miss Marshmallow, attacks you, urging you not to take King P's important yo-yo. This begins an optional boss fight. Defeating the boss awards you the Friends yo-yo, which is a pretty good weapon for this point in the game. From the hints we've gotten, King P appears to be the one running the pig masks. Although it should have been obvious, I mean, he's called King P. <laughs> Ascending once again takes you to the guts of the tower, where you're surrounded by exposed wiring that is constantly sparking, even emitting enemies you can fight, called short circuits. While continuing to climb this final part of the tower, Lucas is all of a sudden struck by lightning that is discharged by the inside of the tower. This causes him to learn PK Flash, a, a pretty helpful move that inflicts status effects and can in some cases one hit kill the enemy you target. The team make it to the very top of the tower's interior, which causes a self-defense alarm to ring as you're now in the generator room. 
This causes a robot to extend from the generator and attack you. This boss fight is pretty challenging with the enemy, Mr. Janita, or Janita, I don't know, occasionally storing electricity and later on discharging it, doing pretty serious damage to multiple party members. The damage that Mr. Janita inflicts can be lessened with a wearable item called a rubber cape, seeing as he attacks with electricity. Unfortunately, I don't think it's quite communicated well enough that these capes have this effect. If you look at the item objectively, it makes sense that it would reduce the power of lightning damage, seeing as it's made from rubber. But within the context of the game, this isn't as obvious. Up to this point, you haven't gotten any elemental armor or weapons, so there's been no precedent set when it comes to countering elemental moves with armor. Considering the fact that the pure defense stat of the cape isn't great, and that they're pretty expensive, the game just discourages you from buying them. Now it's not completely unnecessary to beat the boss, but it is very helpful, especially for people playing for the first time. After defeating Mr. Janitor, an evacuation alarm sounds, with a serious error having occurred within the generator. Facade catches up to you, causing the party to leave out the door to the exterior. You're now at the very top of the tower, right next to the device that has been discharging electricity down onto the houses of those without happy boxes, including Lucas's. Facade follows you out saying that he'll use the Thunder Tower's self-destruction to take the party out all at once. The mother pork ship approaches, blaring that familiar theme. Facade plans to escape on the ship, but as the tower begins to fall apart, he's thrown onto his own banana peel, causing him to slip off the side of the tower to his death. This has got to be one of my favourite moments of the game. Seeing this cocky prick get a death this pathetic is incredibly satisfying, and to have such an important character die by slipping on a banana peel is just a very Mother 3 thing to do. The pork ship descends to let Facade on, trying to retreat once they see that he's no longer there, but rather a gross little stain on the ground below. Duster quickly swings his rope snake which grabs onto the rope ladder, with the rest of the party hanging onto each other for dear life. As the four are trying to hang on, someone we've yet to see walks out, dressed in clothes similar to Lucas's disguise. The rope snake struggles to hang on, eventually losing its grip and causing them all to plummet to the ground. Lucas falls into a field of sunflowers. The music is serene and light and floaty while dipping into some sadder tones. You walk through the field, unsure of what you're actually looking for. Then someone calls out to Lucas, though it seems more spectral, rather than a figure literally calling to him. Boney sits up ahead and Lucas joins him. We see Hinawa flicker into view, seeming to be a vision of sorts.
Oni and Lucas try and catch up, but Hinawa doesn't let him get too close, and she walks off the edge of the field, standing on nothing. Lucas runs and tries to jump to her, but he falls short. He and Boney fall into a pile of hay and Tasmili, somehow still alive. This sequence is important but vague, though I do have my own thoughts on what's happening here. I believe that Hinawa is able to manifest herself to Lucas and Boney because of her connection with them. The experiences they've had with her and the memories they keep allow Hinawa to exist in some form after death, and she uses this version of existence to guide Boney and Lucas at this point. She offers no words and says Lucas's name only once. She's not here for a reunion. She's here to push them further, to urge them to keep fighting. She does this by positioning herself past the sunflower field and over nothing. This way Lucas has to take a leap to reach her, but he falls short, because he's still needed in Tasmili and the Nowhere Islands. This little section is strange, but it makes some sense when you think of Mother 3 as a game. It is reinforced how important community is and the impact that love can have and crafting connections can have so it makes sense that something this strange would happen. It is really just a manifestation of love. Not to mention that one of the game's main themes is the love theme. Landing in the pile of hay is representative of a small but crucial part to Mother 3's storytelling. All throughout the game you'll come across ridiculous, over-the-top coincidences that assist Lucas and the rest of the party. Whether that's just happening to fall in a pile of hay, or learning a powerful attack by randomly getting struck by lightning. It's egregiously convenient, but these actions all prove one thing. Lucas really is meant to go through this journey. Think about other games where the player character is said to be destined to save the world. The endless roadblocks that you'll face during the game make it feel like a farce, and can rob some of the accomplishment from the player. In Mother 3, however, the logic and rules of the world seem to bend themselves to accommodate Lucas. You actually feel like you're fulfilling a destiny as your progress is assisted in totally unrealistic ways, as though you only have some control over the path and story. Lucas wakes up in Alec's room, not at all injured from the fall. Not far from the nursing home, we see Ionia the Magipsy tied up with a crowd of people around them. If you talk to the people around Ionia, you'll notice that they're all unnamed characters, moved to the town after the introduction of Happy Boxes. Some of them seem as though they want to help, but none of them actually do, seemingly afraid of what could happen. This new Tasmili has created people too afraid to help each other because of the unforeseen consequences. Ionia joins the party, saying that the three of you need to go to Aeolia's house. You get a boat ride up the river to get there, but before that you can also explore the town once again. Different people of Tasmili have different reactions to Ionia. Some good, some bad, and others just neutral. This helps build their character out well and provides some individuality. The factory is closed down, but instead of coming back to Tasmili, the residents who worked there instead moved to New Pork City. Many people will mention this new place around town, and a general consensus seems to be that the shine of this new, more developed Tasmili has worn off, making it seem boring now in comparison. This has prompted many to move to the city, which does make the town feel a bit empty. 
You've been conditioned to seek out what the people of Tasmili have to say, but now you can't do that for those in the city, so you feel the loss of them not being there. You get on the boat and it's rowed up the river, soon arriving near Aeolia's house. Soon after entering the house, a strange noise is heard, followed by tremors. With that, Aeolia starts blinking, fading out of existence. She mentions that someone has pulled the needle in a Sohei castle that she's been protecting. She opens up a shortcut to a Sohei, telling you to find out if the person who pulled the needle was good or bad. Aeolia fades out of existence. Ionia, Boney and Lucas take the underground shortcut, coming out the other side at the castle courtyard. Ionia says that she can't sense a good or bad heart, as though the person who pulled the needle was devoid of emotion. Thankfully, she then offers some explanation. The Nowhere Islands are protected by a sleeping dragon that's as big as the islands themselves. Because the dragon was too powerful to control, Majipsi ancestors place seven needles in it to make it fall asleep. Seven Majipsis have each guarded a needle for thousands of years, with it being said that when the dragon's power is needed, someone able to pull the needles will appear. However, the person's heart, whether good or evil, will be passed on to the dragon should they wake it, either resulting in evil ruling or good ruling. It's also said that only those with PK love can pull the needles. Hearing this explanation, you may be reminded of something. In the factory you worked at in Chapter 4, a pig mask mentioned this dark dragon, foreshadowing it hours ago. This is something Mother 3 consistently does, taking advantage of its own tone to create foreshadowing. When the pig mask mentions the dragon, it seems like just another strange line of dialogue, so you don't think too much of it. So the game has blatantly told you an important bit of lore, while using its absurd nature to instead make it serve as subtle foreshadowing. This is done all throughout the game. We saw it earlier with the tower, where Facade mentioned that Tasmili will soon be struck by endless lightning, at the time seeming silly but turning out to be true, something that Facade himself did. This technique is an example of how Mother 3's absurdity becomes more than just being weird for the sake of being weird. The tone and mood this strange writing causes has been considered and thoughtfully taken advantage of. With the explanation over, we see a phone ringing on the ground. Lucas picks it up and a pig mask is asking the commander to come to the Chimera Lab, as that's where the next needle is. Ionia leaves as she's worried about her own needle, with Boney and Lucas heading back to Tasmili. Back at Hanawa's grave, the gravekeeper asks Lucas if he's seen Flint lately. He mentions that Flint needn't worry about Lucas anymore as he's grown to be very strong. He then gives him a courage badge, something that Flint wanted Lucas to have. Even after this short time, if you go look around Tasmili again, some more people have left for Newport City, telling us that people are moving to the city at quite a fast rate. Lucas and Boney take the train to the factory, then make their way to the Chimera Lab. They get led into the lab after being mistaken for part-timers. As part-timers, you're instructed to look for two monkeys who've gone missing and hid somewhere inside. This involves looking around the lab, which is a good way of making you confront what the big mass are doing to make these Chimeras. As you look around, you'll be avoiding a big red chimera. Many of you probably recognize it as the thing from Smash Brothers that fucks you right up if you get too close. In Mother 3, it's known as the ultimate chimera, or the thing that fucks you right up if you get too close. This enemy will kill you instantly if it catches you, making for a nice change of pace. The existence of the ultimate chimera also gives us an insight into the pig masks. They aren't in complete control of these things, and given the chance, these chimeras would kill them. It ties into the fact that the Chimeras aren't a marvel or achievement, they're a tragedy of power and complete lack of empathy and care. While in the lab you'll come across Dr. Endonuts, someone who's being forced to conduct research by quote, a certain man. 
Dr. Endonut is also in Earthbound and he assists you during that game with some of his inventions. It's strange to see him here as the Nowhere Islands seem to be completely separate from where Earthbound took place. Eventually you find the two monkeys, Seltzer and his girlfriend, in the lab. The ultimate chimera then shows up, chasing Lucas and Boney out the room. Seltzer recognises Lucas from when Lucas saved him with the Dragos, so he gives Chase to help him. As the chimera pounces at Boney and Lucas, Seltzer switches the chimera off, saving them both. He then joins the party and you head outside the lab to the big stone door nearby. Seltzer performs the dance from Asohe Castle, opening the door to the Majipsi's house. Inside you see Kumatora and are introduced to Doria the Majipsi. Lucas then heads down to pull the needle. Before you do, however, Doria reflects on her time a bit. What's cool is that she frames the pulling of the needle as a positive thing. Although she will be a little sad, she's also excited as she's essentially fulfilling her purpose. In so many other games, the Majipsis would end up being the bosses you fight to be able to pull the needles. But here, they're a positive force. A group that has immense power, yet doesn't display that through excessive violence but rather affection and compassion. Lucas pulls the needle, with the world shaking and erupting around him. He learns PK Love Beta, the next iteration of the move. This is a nice little way to reward the player while showing how Lucas has grown. Doria disappears for good, leaving a memento with Lucas. These mementos will automatically revive someone when they die, and make these relationships have helpful mechanical merit as well, making their impact more pronounced and characterization reinforced. Kumatora seems to be pondering the road ahead and ask if she can come along to see it to the end. The party of three say goodbye to the two monkeys, setting off for the next needle. As you leave the lab area, you run into the mole cricket that you fought in the first battle of the game. He asks you to battle him in the mole cricket hole, so you follow him there. He again builds up how exceptionally strong he is and the elder mole cricket joins in, warning how tough the fight will be. So this time you kill him even faster. You're then directed by the Mole Cricket to Snowcap Mountain, which can be accessed from an exit on the opposite side of the Mole Hole. <laughs> Leaving the hole really isn't very difficult, you just need to glance at the map every now and then. Exiting the hole, Kumatora, Boney and Lucas find themselves on the mountain. You make your way up it, along the way battling yetis and ice dogs, which are luckily not as bad as the dogs from Earthbound. You also come across another friendly item guy, but this time without his card. Despite this, he still has all your items. Where are you keeping my items, you freak? A little further up the mountain, you find the Majipsi, Lydia. Inside her house, you can find a pig mask sleeping. Lydia found them separated from the others, apparently lost. As you go to leave, you hear the pig mask theme and walk out to see the masked man pull the needle. He flies off, leaving you to fight another boss, the Steel Mechorilla. This swooping in and taking the needle represents the pig masks well. They fly in on new technology, but leave a mess in their wake. In the pursuit of power, they're foregone consideration of others and the world that they live in. After defeating the boss, Lydia exits to see the needle has been pulled. She insists that Lucas must pull the rest of the needles, and fades away. Back in Lydia's place, the pig mask has removed his... well, pig mask. He's gonna stay and take care of Lydia's bunnies, and says he won't help you, but won't stop you either. It's nice to get a humanizing moment for a pig mask, and that they aren't portrayed as being purely evil. It shows that some people have likely been fooled by the lies of Facade and others, possibly joining with good intentions. Though that doesn't really excuse what they've done. You then leave Snowcat Mountain, sledding a fridge down it and jumping back into Tasmili Cemetery. In the cemetery, you'll see a message in a bottle. The message leads you to a secret passage and, judging by the font, was sent by a Mr. Satin. 
Another message directs you towards the Thunder Tower so you travel there. You make your way through the same open area we used to get to the Thunder Tower previously. Things have progressed a little, like the cow now being in the bathroom instead of in the line. It's a small detail that makes the world feel more alive as it's changing and developing even when you're not there. You'll come across some road construction and so head down the tunnel that's been made. Leaving the tunnel, the party enters Saturn Valley. As you look around and in the houses, you see that the pig masks have invaded Saturn Valley and are attempting to force the nosy boys to tell them where the needle is. You clear them out from the area, finding Duster is in one of the houses. After freeing him, you head north as the Mr. Saturn say that's where the next needle is. You come into this volcano area and head into Phrygia's house. She's the sleeping Magipsy and so she's left Lucas a note for when he arrives. The note says to continue to the volcano itself where the next needle can be found. This process of collecting and pulling the needles is the closest Mother 3 comes to having a more traditional structure. Up until this point, progress is marked by narrative beats, not necessarily by completing a single objective. You simply do things as you're directed to, with the story unfolding along the way. Then once the seven needles are discussed, the end goal becomes to pull them all. You can immediately see that this is how the game will progress going forward. Head to the new area, dispose of threat, meet Magipsy, collect needle. This change in structure could ruin the pace of the game, but Mother 3's charm stops this from happening. Chapter 7 isn't perfect, but by repeatedly introducing new characters, areas and enemies, it still feels like you're making some type of progress, even if the narrative itself doesn't move along much. This is helped by the fact that this structure doesn't come into play until like halfway through the game. In most JRPGs, this search for different MacGuffins becomes the main motivation and objective just a few hours in, spanning the rest of the game. But by introducing this later on, Mother 3 can rely on the fact that the player has become interested in the world and characters, stopping it from seeming pointless or boring. You also learn more about the Pigmas and Noah Islands as you go, so it still feels like you're being rewarded narratively by visiting new places and pulling the needles, even if you're mostly being told backstory. The volcano is a small dungeon filled with some new and disturbing enemies. Despite that, the area isn't too tough and before long you'll find yourself walking up to pull the needle. Before that can be done though, a new and in improved facade floats down. He has a jetpack and two horns coming from where his mouth used to be. As he can't speak, he has a small robot that interprets what he's saying. Facade himself has essentially become a chimera now, showing that he's only becoming more obsessed with the ideology and methods of the pig masks and their leader. Facade is robbing himself of his own humanity in an attempt to become more powerful. With the new Facade introduced, you enter a boss fight. This fight feels appropriately important as he's essentially been the main villain of the game so far. He has powerful physical attacks along with a lot of status effect inflicting moves and the ability to heal himself for around 550 HP at a time. Combine that with the fact that you have four party members again, and the powerful PSI moves Lucas and Kumatora have, and it makes for a tense, challenging boss. Defeating Facade is really satisfying, not just because he's such a piece of shit, but because last time the needle was taken out from under your nose, and you're able to prevent that this time. With Facade defeated, he flies off, saying he'll get revenge. Lucas pulls the needle, learning the next level of PK love. Phrygia then arrives, telling Lucas and the others where the other needles can be found. One is on Taintain Island, south of Tasmili, and the other in... <laughs> okay, how do you say that? Chupi Chup Yoi. And the other in Chupi Chup Yoi Temple, in the Oriander Mountains. I have no confidence that that's how that's said, but I can't think of any other way of pronouncing it. Ah, oh, fuck it, we'll just go with that. They also mentioned that one needle can't be located, the one that's said to be sticking out of the dragon's head. Phrygia then disappears and the party head back to Saturn Valley. As you arrive, a pig mask blows the exit closed in an attempt to delay you, trapping the party in the valley. Luckily, the Saturns have a way of getting out. As you wait for this solution, a Mr. Saturn asks for your courage badge, saying they'll polish it for you. With the flying device, a cage full of birds, complete, you fly back to Tasmili, holding onto the rope snake. The snake once again fails to hold on, dropping everyone into the water at Tasmili's beach, eventually washing up onto the shore.
Tasmili is just as empty as it was earlier, unfortunately not changing much at all. At the beach, a crab informs you that to get to Tain Tain you need to walk across the ocean. So you simply walk into the ocean, finding yourself underwater. In this part of the game you have a breath meter, which can be restored by these dudes. Yeah. This new mechanic is neat in that it causes you to make calculated risks to get an item or manage your route properly so that you can make it to the next air machine. That being said, if you'd like to get everything, trial and error is required as you don't know where the next air machine will be. This discourages exploration as running out of air puts you back on the beach, incentivizing people to take the most efficient and direct route so as to avoid repetition. So although it's an interesting idea, it's one that could be iterated upon to be more enjoyable and less tedious. Once reaching a certain point in the ocean, you'll be sucked into a battle against this creature called Master Eddie. It's actually impossible to win this fight as you have to lose to push the narrative forward, but you can't just let yourself die. It's a strange encounter where your death is scripted, but to get to this scripted death, you have to fight your way through a good portion of the boss. With his final move, he inflicts around 670 damage to everyone, in the process knocking all the items the party is carrying off them. Lucas, Kumatora, Boney, and Duster wake up on the shore of Taintain Island with no items and only one HP. Just past the beach you find some energizing mushrooms. With no health or items and no other means of healing yourself, you decide to eat them. Duster, Kumatora, and Lucas feel odd, soon passing out. When they come to, the world is distorted. The colours have changed, the save frog is no longer in a snake but an umbrella, and members of Lucas's family are wandering around. Lucas talks to Flint, triggering a battle with an eerie smile. After doing some damage, the eerie smile becomes a zombie shroom, revealing its identity. Further into the island, you come across mailboxes filled with endless screams and never-ending darkness. It seems as though the thoughts and feelings of the party are manifesting in front of them. When they fight enemies, they imagine them to be hateful versions of people they love. When Lucas looks inside the mailboxes, he's seeing all the things he believes people are saying when he's not there. To fight these enemies, you have to approach and talk to them. The party has to choose to fight them, almost as though they can't overcome this trauma without being proactive and taking control of how they process it. These enemies also give a lot of XP, emphasizing the fact that the party is growing rapidly by being brave enough to confront their own personal demons. This section exists to show us how these characters are feeling. By seeing how the negative thoughts are manifesting, we understand how this journey has affected them mentally. Instead of the characters dictating this to each other, it's visualized and made to have mechanical ramifications. As you progress, these hallucinations get more abstract. The characters repeat themselves, at times not even making coherent sentences. It's like the enemies lose power as each member of the party begins to confront their own negativity. The strength of these enemies is important too. They're strong enough to require thoughtful contribution from each member of the party during battle. It's as though working through this trauma would be much harder alone. You're only able to survive by supporting each other. After many battles, you finally make it to the Majipsi's house. Lucas, Kumatora, and Duster can rest. You meet Mixolydia, or Missy. She essentially snaps you out of it, the world returning to normal. Ocho the Octopus also returns all your items after picking them up on the beach. This is a nice way to hammer home that the characters are still themselves. You've overcome those demons and come out the other side stronger and just as well equipped. You head out for the Needle, which is through a cave and up a mountainous area. When you arrive there, you come across the Barrier Trio, who are guarding the location. 
The trio will strike poses during battle, making them immune to all but one of the elemental PK moves. As they know very strong PSI moves, including PK Star Storm, you need to make good use of PSI shields and understand the role of each party member thoroughly to defeat them. This boss is pretty tough but can be caught in a loop where they will buff their defense every turn if you continue to lower it. This means they'll never actually make an offensive move, allowing you to focus on dealing as much damage as possible. After striking one last spectacular pose, they'll be beaten. With the barrier trio gone, Lucas can pull the needle. However, the masked man, along with some pig masks, swoop in once again. The masked man calls down lightning, striking the party and leaving them lying on the ground. He approaches the needle and pulls it. I think that having the masked man steal another needle right in front of you kills some of the momentum here. It's not really surprising, but demoralizing. To put in that time and to defeat the hardest boss in the game up to this point, only to be denied of the reward, it's pretty frustrating and can begin to make the needle hunt feel a bit pointless. Perhaps you're meant to feel downtrodden so that you can rise to the occasion anyway, but this is never mirrored by any of the characters so it doesn't feel as though that's how it's being framed and presented. Soon Missy wakes everyone up, with the pig mask having departed already. She leaves you with her memento and fades away. After heading back to the beach, Ocho takes you back to Tazmili on his back. Roaming Tazmili, you find few people are still around. As you mill about, the music is sombre, never changing as you enter shops or homes. This communicates that Tazmili has lost its character. A big part of why it was so safe was because of the people who live there. Without them, it's no longer Tazmili. At this point in the game, walking around the town feels almost nostalgic. You can clearly remember when it was filled with people who all had their personal opinions and points of view. Those same people have all left to the same place to do the same thing, becoming controlled by consumption by those who manufactured consent. Seeing Tasmili like this, in its saddest form, it piles onto the motivation you have to take down this King P. You get your map marked by Mapson, so you can go to the Sixth Needle and be one step closer. Lucas and the others find themselves on the other side of the Sunshine Forest, heading north to Argilla Pass. As they enter, they trip over, dropping a jar of yummy pickles that Missy gave them to deliver to Ionia. This begins a strange little section where you play as Boney looking for the jar of pickles. I think this part is trying to show them working as a team. That although Tasmili and the Nowhere Islands have changed, that there's still hope. However, it just feels unnecessary and it's not entertaining enough to justify the interruption. You travel through Argilla Pass, through a cave system on the way to Ionia. Along the way you find a room with one single enemy in it. This is Negative Man. Negative Man is a very sad slice of cheese? Sponge? I don't fucking know. He'll never attack you, merely muttering insults to himself as he cries. So you sit there beating on this thing as it does nothing but hate itself, and then once you beat it you receive 3 XP. 3. <laughs> This fight is so absurd that it does a much better job of lifting the mood than searching for the pickles does. In a way it is sad, but it's so unexpected that it's hard not to laugh at as well. You make it out the other side of the cave system and walk north to Ionia's house. Inside they give you the waters of time to get rid of the vines on Chupi Chupiue Temple. Just outside the home, you see a Saturn who returns the Courage Badge which has now been polished to become a Franklin Badge. At the entrance to the temple, the masked man and some pig masks are trying to brute force their way inside. You fight some of them off, defeating them and walking to confront the masked man. He tries to knock the party out once again with lightning, however Lucas's Franklin badge reflects it, knocking the masked man to his knees. Thus starts a battle against him. The Masked Man is not too difficult, especially after the Barrier Trio, but the ability he has to destroy all shields on the battlefield can be a regular hazard making defending a more time consuming matter. He can also use PK Love, connecting him in some way to Lucas. After a long battle, the Masked Man is bested, taking off with the Pig Masks. 
I said earlier that having the masked man steal two needles from under you was too much, but I must admit that it adds to the satisfaction of beating him here. I think ultimately I'd still prefer not having the second needle stolen though, as I feel it creates a dissonance that the game does a really good job of avoiding otherwise. You enter the temple using the waters of time, and as the four stand in front of the needle, Ionia enters. She stresses that Lucas needs his friends to complete this task, and teaches Kumatora PK Starstorm. Lucas pulls the sixth needle, making it the third one he's pulled, tied with a masked man. Lucas learns the next level of PK love, and Ionia fades away. The party leave the temple as a limousine pulls up outside. A chauffeur steps out, informing you that the new leader of the world, Master Porky, has invited Lucas to New Pork City. If you refuse to enter the limo, the chauffeur insists that when it comes to Master Porky, there are no no's. No, not no no's, like there aren't any no's. No, not that no's, or that no's. This no. There are no no's. Ah, oh, fuck it. Anyway, with you inside, the limo takes off flying away to the city. The limousine is spacious and filled with all sorts of things. There's a pool table, bars, seating and much more, but upon closer inspection, none of this can actually be used. It all appears to be fake, existing to give off the impression of expense rather than the reality of it. After looking around, you soon make it to New Pork City. It's expansive, being the only location in Mother 3 that could really qualify as a city. With one tower in particular being incredibly big, looming over the whole city. Entering New Pork City has this strange sense of excitement, much like visiting a new city in real life. You've been hearing about this place for a while now, people have been abandoning Tasmili to come here, so you're heading in with some sort of anticipation. The game's put in the work to foreshadow and build up the city, and it makes your time here feel so much like a culmination of the journey thus far. Practically everything you do here is payoff for what you've been hearing people say for so long. This excitement will quickly turn to a sort of satisfaction. As you see that New Pork City is mostly made up of facades, like literal building facades, not that facade. If you look at the map, only 4 or 5 buildings actually have interiors compared to the 40 or so fakes. Seeing this validates all the hatred you have for King P, who we now know is called Master Porky, as well as Facade and the Pig Masks. Porky has been putting in all this work to convince people, or force people, to come to the city, because the location itself is empty and shallow much like his perspective and ideology. As you wander around, you'll see familiar faces from Tasmili, with Lucas being the last person from the town to come to New Pork. 
Some people are completely bought into Porky's lies, like Isaac who's become a pig mask, and Thomas, who is obsessed with the arcade. Others are skeptical, like Biff, who wonders if people are gathering, or rather being gathered in New Pork. There certainly is an argument to be made that the actual main antagonist not even being named until this late in the game is bad pacing or writing, but I would disagree. Now that we actually know who's running the show, Porky, we can begin to piece together what they're like. Throughout the last 20 hours, we've learnt that the pig masks are cruel, childish, petty and evil. So even though we're only just getting to interact with the villain now, the rest of the game has already been establishing his character and personality. Knowing the pig masks allows us to understand what the person making these orders and decisions must be like. This makes for a villain that we despise and feel motivated to defeat from the second we hear their name. So, up until this point, I've tried to relay the plot throughout this video as closely as I can to the actual game, but at this point I need to stray from that a bit. Porky is actually Pokey from Earthbound. Pokey was Ness's neighbour who, as the game progressed, somehow became more and more powerful, eventually being the second in command to Gaius, the main villain. So knowing that, we can better understand Porky and his motivations. He was someone already obsessed with power, but after being defeated by Ness, he has become irrationally focused on that particular battle, in a way wanting to destroy everything to prove that he is the most powerful being in the world. This obsession can be seen in the theatre, which plays a projection showing parts from Earthbound. This aspect will also be shown again and again during this final chapter. New Pork City also serves really well as a concentration of all the game's themes and the connections they share. This city has become the driving force of destroying a community, one that was torn apart thanks to shallow consumerism and a twisted idea of what progress was. New Pork also demonstrates how a picture of progress built on power and profit is one that ultimately tries to leave the organic world behind while also being dependent on it, creating an unsustainable model for the future. We see this in the fact that a grand statue of Porky is being supported by a tree, yet one that has been gnarled and perverted by industrialization. The game has been telling us what it thinks, showing us these themes and ideas being played out, only to take us to the monument of all of it at the end of the game. That's why New Pork City feels so final, because it's the culmination of all of Mother 3's messaging and perspective. While in the theatre, you find a man that tells you that your leader is locked underground, and it seems to be the only lead you have about where you might need to go next, so you follow it. The group makes their way into the sewer to find this leader. This sewer area represents Porky and his way of life. The glamour of New Pork above ground seeming fun and advanced, with the sewer, the truth, running under the surface, gross, sinister, and vile. The sewer only extends so far, and you'll soon enter a rundown apartment building, which is here, for some reason. Look, I couldn't find some pretentious justification for everything in this game. On the other side of a door on the second floor, you come across Letter. Or Leader? I can't even remember what I called him at the start now. You come across Letter. In Tasmili, Letter existed only to ring the comically tall bell. Here he's surrounded by books, with his feet chained up and attached to heavy weight so that he can't move. Or escape, rather. There's this mournful sort of music playing. It sounds like something sad has happened in a cartoon, and it totally fits seeing Letter trapped here, staring forward blankly. Here you can hear him talk, the first time in the whole game. And boy, does he have something to say. What follows is a massive lore dump. Like, 20 minutes long massive. One that is so sudden and filled with content and context that it can be hard to keep all in your head. If I haven't already shown myself to be a complete sucker for this game, then it will definitely show here. <laughs> I don't dislike this decision. Ideally, this would be stuff that you learn throughout the game, catching bits and pieces here and there, with it finally coming together and making sense at the climax. But instead, let it just regurgitates the history of the Nowhere Islands and Tasmili to you. That being said, the game at least has the self-awareness to understand that this is a lot to take in, as you're given an item that can repeat all of this info on demand. Additionally, the game does let you find some of those bits and pieces, it's just that they all pay off here instead of satisfyingly discovering and decoding it yourself. So let's actually go over what Letter tells us. I'm also going to go over my thoughts, theories and ideas. So, Letter mentions that there used to exist a massive world presumably the world from Mother 2, that was much larger than the Nowhere Islands. Thanks to humans, this world ended. 
Right before this end, a white ship carried all the people who would later become citizens of Tasmili to the Nowhere Islands. Some people predicted the world was coming to an end, and so devised this white ship plan. The people who had settled on the Nowhere Islands were the few to survive the apocalypse, as the islands were protected thanks to the immense power of the Dark Dragon. People used to coexist with the dragon, but this soon ceased to be the case, resulting in the placement of the Seven Needles, putting it to sleep. This process was exercised by Majipsis, who've lived on the islands for thousands of years. The people who had evaded the end of the world feared another apocalypse, as they felt that the previous one was a result of how humans had lived and impacted the world. The world of Mother 2 was one that had progressed much like the islands have now under Porky, though slower. It was a world with more technological advancements, and one that is more recognisable to us, the player. We can infer that it's this way of life that these people felt brought on the apocalypse. It makes sense that Porky would follow this path as well, as he lived in that world, and has become obsessed with his failures in it, particularly his inability to stop Ness and his friends from defeating him and Gygus. The people from the White Ship decided that to avoid the same path again, they'd erase everyone's memories, allowing them to start over. Before this fresh start, everyone would devise a story they'd play out, with all the stories working in conjunction to create a peaceful, functioning town and community. And so everyone's memories were wiped, replaced with these stories instead. Despite this new beginning, they still wanted to store their old memories, leading to the Hummingbird Egg. In their new lives, Wes and Duster would know how to protect the egg should a threat appear. This explains why Wes and Duster knew to protect it and how to do so without knowing why they knew or how. As a backup, one person was chosen to retain their memories of the previous world, with that person being Letta. Before Tasmili was ever created, a kingdom lived on the Nowhere Islands, centred around the King of Asohe. These people seem to have left the islands in fear of the dragon possibly being awoken from its sleep. Before Kumitora boarded the White Ship, she was an orphan. In this new life, she was raised by the Majipsis, with her now being called the Princess of Asohe Castle. People from the White Ship wanted to create more history, but simply ran out of time. Letter begins to speak as though he's a developer of the game here, in a sense, mentioning that with more time, the Nowhere Islands, and by extension Mother 3, would be bigger, richer, and more involved. As we saw, Mother 3's development cycle was erratic. It wasn't consistently worked on for those 12 years, so it is very possible that the scenario and world was still rushed in some parts, and not quite what the original vision was. These new stories actually worked, with people believing they'd always lived in Tasmili. This changed, however, when Porky arrived. Porky used some device to travel through time and space, though was rejected from other areas and places, eventually settling in the Nowhere Islands. He then used this device to bring people from other eras to the islands. He brainwashed these people, turning them into Pigmas and the other unnamed characters we've seen. With this new army, he began doing the things we've seen over the course of Mother 3, creating chimeras, building the Thunder Tower, and continuing to build the army. Porky soon learned about the White Ship thanks to a traitor within the Majipsis. The traitor was the only Majipsi we haven't met in the game yet, the one that we're searching for now. After learning of the dragon, Porky wanted the power it can give to whoever pulls the needles. He found someone who could do this, controlling them and making them his puppet. We learn that Porky has gathered everyone to Newport City for the pulling of the final needle. Finally, Letta tells Lucas to head for the 100th floor of the Empire Porky building, to find out where the final needle is. Whew. Okay, we got that out of the way. In this context, Porky becomes something different. He serves as a reminder of what humanity did to the world, and that we can't simply brush off past transgressions, expecting to move forward in ignorance. As humans, and as people, we have to acknowledge what we're doing to the world and study it, so that we can then fix it and prevent it from happening again in the future. Even after erasing all their memories, the people of Tasmili couldn't escape the circumstances under which they settled on the Nowhere Islands. The ones in power are most responsible for the current state of the world, but the rest of us still have to take responsibility as well, as the process of changing for the better may mean removing those powers. And that's what we're going to do right now, in the 100th floor of the Empire Porky building. So you're all pumped up. This 
This string bean looking motherfucker just gave a hell of a speech, and it's time to get topside. But as you approach the exit, something bursts out of the sewage, and then facade floats down into view. The boss fight starts, and you're introduced to Miracle Facade. Now with more horns, he barely looks human. This robotic look along with the fact that he no longer has a voice makes him kind of sad to fight. He's only gotten more obsessed with changing himself, becoming less recognisable, and more machine than man. With that said, he's still a despicable piece of shit, so it's time to kill. The music gives off this sense of urgency, like you have to beat him as soon as possible so you can go save the world. Interestingly, Facade has an off-key music attack, which could be implying that even with all these changes, he's not somehow become superior or better in any way. He's still talking bullshit. This time it just comes as a flat note. The fight itself is pretty exhilarating, with a good sense of challenge to make it feel important. He has multiple moves that damage a whole party, including PK Starstorm. However, if you take a few turns debuffing him and buffing your party, you should be able to stay on top. Just make sure you've memorized the menus if you need to heal someone in a pinch. As you progress, Facade's horns will be knocked off, making him more human as he takes damage, and begins to deal out more damage. After his defeat, Facade has something interesting to say. You have bested me, kind sirs. Actually, no. You did not best me. You were merely detestable. I'm sick of all this fighting. Very extremely sick of it. This is all just a game. You could call it Master Porky's game. Facade is sick of following Porky. He's glad to escape this game through death. In a sense, Lucas is still trapped. You leave the sewer and Facade behind. The streets of New Pork City are different now, filled with more people. The thing is, many of these people speak in nonsense, making simple one-word sentences, repeating themselves over and over. We now know that Porky is pulling these people from other eras and brainwashing them, and it seems like he's getting desperate, quickly rushing out subjects of his that are incapable of being coherent. It kind of feels like you've got to him, like he's trying to prove that he's still got control. You're getting the upper hand in a subtle way, and it's really satisfying. The lobby of the Empire Porky building is nice and shockingly tasteful for Porky. You go to take the elevator to the 100th floor, only to find out that it only stops at the 24th one. On the 24th floor, a DC MC concert is happening, the show for King P that was advertised in Club Tidibu. On this floor, you also see a couple. These two people can be seen in numerous places staring at each other, both nervously wondering if the other has a crush on them. Here, they're finally together, now wondering if the other wants to kiss them. This is such a small thing, but the fact that these two people get some sort of narrative arc is part of what makes Mother 3 so incredible. With everything that's going on in the game up to this point, these tertiary characters could justifiably be forgotten about, but Mother 3 refuses. It's these little details that make the world feel alive, like it exists and makes sense. In the concert hall, Duster reunites with DCMC, making for a cute moment. He puts his old wig back on and the show starts. However, it stopped shortly after it began, with the power being cut. We then hear Porky speak over an intercom, asking those with enough pathetic courage to come to the 100th floor. Lucas, Boney, Kumatora and Duster get on the elevator, heading to the 100th floor.
Floor 100 is a grassy area with pools of water filled with wading hippo launches. It quickly becomes clear that this isn't the actual 100th floor, and as you reach the end, Porky chimes in to mock you, saying you're so close to the real 100th floor. The next floor is just upsetting. It's one big bedroom filled with women who love Porky, which means it's filled with women who've been brainwashed to love Porky. Oh god, I don't like that. He quickly asks you to come to the real 100th floor. You've known that the person running the pig mask was childish and immature, but finally having Porky talk to you, hearing his tone of voice and the way he speaks, it backs up the characterization set out for him really well. He easily slots into the position that you imagined him occupying. That's another reason I think introducing him this late isn't a detriment. He's just as unlikable as he thought he would be. The next level 100 is a maze of bathrooms, with some being occupied by NPCs or enemies. In one of these bathrooms you can find all the friendly ghosts from a Sohei packed into one room, demonstrating that Porky really has gathered everyone for the end of the world. As you make it to the next 100th floor, the tone changes. A slower, bearer version of the Majipsi theme is playing, and a Majipsi house sits in the center of the room. Porky asks you to move on, obviously not wanting you to dwell here. Inside the house you see boxes of bananas, a memento and some horns. This was the home of the 7th Majipsi. This was the home of Facade. Seeing this, it humanizes Facade, or Locria rather. We've seen the other Majipsis. They were all well intentioned, wanting the world to start anew with Lucas's heart being passed onto the dragon. So who's to say Locria wouldn't have been the same? Our previous experiences make us feel like we know who we lost to an extent, even if we never did. This also shows the power Porky's brainwashing could have. It even worked on those who were thousands of years old. If Locria was brainwashed, that is. We may have hated Facade, but that doesn't mean we can't mourn the loss of Locria. Floor 100 version 5 is under construction, filled with experimental mechanical chimeras that stalk the scaffolding. Seeing an area clearly unfinished like this makes you wonder if Porky was caught off guard by how fast we collected the needles. It gives you a bit of insight into the way Porky is ultimately trying to trick himself into thinking he's greater than he actually is. The party takes the elevator once again, finding themselves in a more clinical floor, some sort of laboratory. The chimeras here are now pure robots, no longer having any animal components. In fact, the chimeras throughout the Empire Porking building have only gotten more robotic, and less natural as you move further up the tower, and coincidentally, closer to Porky. At the end of this area, you'll find a receptionist, introducing the nice person hot spring which turns you into someone who respects Master Porky. The next room is actually filled with green capsules, all containing a person or animal. These people are being brainwashed, turned into someone who likes Porky and how he's changed the world. Showing us this room makes the brainwashing process more believable in the world, helping us better understand Porky's methods. Leaving this room, you find yourself in a void, with only a staircase leading up. There's some uncharacteristically pleasant music playing, making this one of the few nice places in the building. This area disarms you to an extent, cleansing the palette and making you ready for some more weirdness. Through the door upstairs, you find yourself in this game show-like environment, where you'll be tested to see if you're fit to meet Porky. This involves playing a bunch of mini-games against a small robot controlled by Porky. However, winning these games isn't how you progress. If you win, Porky will throw a tantrum. You're supposed to let him win by a hair, making sure it's not obvious you were throwing the match. You have to play whack-a-mole, run an obstacle course, and see who can blow a balloon up fastest. These activities lose their fun because of how you're forced to play. Turning these games that could be blazed through into tedious time wasters makes the sequence frustrating but appropriate. Porky is so childish that he can't stand to lose, even though it's likely he knows you're letting him win. Seeing this plays out makes him seem that much more pathetic. It makes you want to stop him from pulling the final needle that much more, because you know it'll be satisfying. 
After playing these games, you exit through a door, finding yourself in another staircase. At the next door, you enter a room with just you and a massive pig-like robot. It's time to fight the natural killer cyborg. The track that plays during this fight feels appropriately chaotic and intense, making your attacks feel more meaningful and the hits that you take that much more deadly. This is further emphasised by the size of the boss. It takes up the whole screen, being the most physically imposing thing you've seen all game. Mixing a robot with something recognisable like a pig makes it look just... wrong. This encounter can be really difficult, but if Kumatora has learned PK Ground, then it gets a lot easier. PK Ground hits 5 times in one use, doing around 150 to 200 damage per hit. The Cyborg Killer can still hit back hard though, keeping you on your toes. The fight can go by pretty quickly, adding to the intense, deadly nature of it, and I don't think beating a boss this easily is always a bad thing. It just shows how much more powerful you've become, and it can be super gratifying. Moving through the door that was being guarded by the cyborg, you'll find yourself in a very long hallway with a sweet song playing. It sounds almost like a lullaby, telling a small story while having this childish tone. It gives some nice weight to this simple walk. It feels significant, like this lullaby, this story, is coming to an end. Stepping out of the hallway, you enter a strange room filled with water and a boat. The boat drifts through the pool, taking you past memorabilia from Earthbound. The phone, the ATM, and the Skyrunner. Them, among other things, are all on display. This display shows us again how Porky's become obsessed with that time in his life, and that fight. He's kept all these reminders of that time, not being able to move past it. At the same time, this could be here as a show of power from Porky, like him saying that he was able to take these things from another time and place, still coming out alive. This would play into his characterization, as his displays of power and the way he uses that power have always been childish and more pitiful than intimidating, so attempting to impress but instead seeming insecure, it makes perfect sense. Continuing on, the environment is now made of stone and moss, looking dank, damp and decrepit. The music is atmospheric, sounding hollow and inhuman. Eventually the party enters a large bare room, looking over the Nowhere Islands. The ceiling is tangled with vines and wiring. Panning back down, Porky now stands right in front of us. He approaches, asking to be friends. When Lucas refuses, he explodes. And that's the end of the game. Credits roll, thanks for watching, I hope you have a great time. Five more of these Porky robots fall, initiating battle. These bots aren't too powerful individually, but altogether they create a battle that is more an endurance test. This is a good change of pace for boss battles, as they typically involve trying to inflict as much damage as possible while staying alive where here you have to spread out the damage over more targets. The five Porky bots are destroyed when after a slight pause another drops, bringing two Chimeras with it. This little bait and switch is what sells this fight. This is the only time a battle continues like this, so it's completely unexpected, giving this feeling of worry, wondering if you're going to fail this fight like 10 minutes in. A seventh bot joins the battle, along with more Chimeras. After the seventh bot, it feels like it's finally over until three more drop down. However, DCMC appear. A DCMC track kicks in, feeling triumphant and hectic. They all attack, taking out the three remaining Porky bots, ending the battle. The relationship you have with these guys being shifted to have mechanical importance makes it all the more rewarding. Even if you weren't too interested in these characters, the time spent with them is still useful as they were able to help in an important fight that seemed to never end. After the battle ends, Flint enters the room too, along with Wes and a number of other characters. Even if they were fooled by Porky, or bought in at some point, they have taken that responsibility and removed themselves as cogs in Porky's machine, instead becoming hazards, trying to stop the wheels from turning. 
After speaking with them again and again throughout the game, it's nice to know they showed up for you. Porky begins speaking again trying to command attention. The wires and gears in the ceiling purr, lowering a life-preserving device with some old grey man inside. That's Porky. Just like everything he's done on the Nowhere Islands, he's empty, lifeless and devoid of soul. He sputters and coughs as he talks, fighting to get the words out. Porky then begins to reveal his perspective. He believes that humans will always become a victim to themselves. He believes the people of Tasmili would have been happy if they allowed themselves to be controlled by him. Porky speaks as though he's aware of his own selfishness while condemning you for not falling in line with those same selfish needs. He believes people are inherently bad and so should be controlled and forced to live under specific oppressive systems forced into a happiness dependent on ignorance. He's taken advantage of the ignorance he bred, playing with people in their lives like it's nothing. It's an ideology built upon unhealthy power balances, one that conveniently puts him at the helm of the world. Porky's only convinced himself that his way is the one road to happiness so that he can do the things he's done under the guise of helping others. He's too pathetic to admit that he's evil, or maybe just too self-centered. As he monologues, an alarm sounds. The seventh needle has just been found, deep underground the Empire Porky building. Porky urges Lucas to find the final needle as well, with an elevator lowering from the floor, taking Duster, Kumatora, Boney, Flint and Lucas down to where the needle lays. elevator plummets, throwing the five out of the door as it makes a crushing impact with the ground. At the bottom, Flint asks you if he can go ahead, insisting you let him. He says to come after him if he's been gone for a long time. You're eager to reach the needle though, so you venture forth. The area is desolate. You walk on large rock cliffs and your footsteps echo off the sheer rock faces. There's no music, just some atmospheric sounds. It reminds me of waves crashing against rock, though a bit more sinister, and in this context, foreboding. Lucas and the others descend hundreds of stone steps, juxtaposing the ones he walked up in the Empire Porky building. There, the party was rising to the challenge, but they got to the top, coming no closer to pulling the needle or eliminating Porky. So now, they're walking down to Porky's level having to take a shortcut, almost playing Porky's game just so they can get close enough to him. After descending some ladders, you find something of note. It's the doorknob from Lucas's front door. It fell off when Thomas tried to open the door during the fire in the Sunshine Forest. This may indicate that Flint made it this far, that he kept a reminder of that night when he lost his wife. It could also be more symbolic, like the things that Lucas needs to open the doors, aka overcome challenges, that lead to the final needle are being provided. His fate is being fulfilled. When Lucas goes to pick up the doorknob, he drops it. At this point, choices are being taken out of his hands. Or it could just be a throwback to the start of the game. What do I know? After some time, a floor is reached, flattening out. This area looks as though it's under construction, which may mean this is a creation of the pig mask army. This final, empty, soulless area sits at the heart of Newport City. It represents Porky. A familiar face sits nearby, the faithful save frog. And not much further along, a gift box has a hot spring inside. Man. Hearing that peaceful song after so long, after using the revitalizing machines for a few hours, it brings a great sense of relief. It almost grounds you in a sense. The game has trained you to associate this song with safety and a fully healed party, 
So placing it here in the middle of this oppressive bleak atmosphere, it just makes you warm inside, much like hot spring. Leaving through the doorway next to the hot spring, you enter a more overbearing area, one that's abstract and haunting. The music jitters around like something is hiding in the void that surrounds the narrow pathways. This feels like an area coursing with energy. It feels like the place where the world is controlled from. The group continue to move through these caverns with there being no environmental signs of progression. This area feels endless. After a while, Flint's hat flies by and up ahead you find him kneeling, not moving. You rush over to him and he reveals something. The masked man, the one who's become Porky's slave, the one who's stolen needles right from under you and the one you're racing to stop right now? He's Klaus. He's Lucas's brother and Flint's son. Flint is conflicted. He finally found his son, but in the last place you'd want to. Despite this, he urges Lucas to be the one who pulls the final needle. This reveal is strange. If you've been paying attention while playing the game, it's not that hard to figure out. You likely knew already. It also feels a bit random. It's not immediately surrounded by anything important, making it feel sudden. Maybe there should be some distant noise that implies a confrontation is happening somewhere ahead, or something like that. It just could have made this moment a bit more special. That's not to say it's bad. The conflict Flint has is heartbreaking and it gives the ambiguity of what happens next some nice anticipation, but it's not perfect. Flint stays kneeling and you have to leave him be, continuing to move forward. At this point you're crossing narrow metal bridges to continue on. The geography here is unstable, it's being circumvented and ignored. It further makes this feel like a place you simply shouldn't be. It's unnatural. In this area you find a real bat, a weapon for Lucas that is incredibly powerful, providing great offense and a boost to maximum PP. For the whole game, you've been using progressively better sticks, and now you're using a bat, the main weapon finesse of Earthbound. This could mean that Porky placed this item, like he's trying to manipulate the fight you'll have against him so that it's as much like the one he had with Ness, recreating it in a sense. A bit further along, the path widens to form a large clearing and as you walk on it, Porky chimes in, asking you to stop. He's in the same device as before, this time equipped with six legs that give him mobility. He's not letting you go any further. Porky speaks of the masked man, of Klaus, as though he's a monster calling him it, dehumanizing him. He seems unable to believe that the masked man is a person. Yeah, it's time to kill this fucker. The music is grand, flowing through a number of instrumental changes that make it accompany the rhythm of the battle well. Porky's machine is designed to look like a spider, with many legs and fangs in the front. He has a wide array of moves, with most targeting multiple party members, or the whole party. This makes him a nuisance, and Lucas will likely be purely on support duty during the fight. Even against the person who reduced his brother to nothing, he still primarily fights supportively, non-violently. Partway through the fight, he speaks. Porky says that no matter what, he'll never die, that he can't be killed. He's mocking you and reassuring himself. He continues to ramble throughout the fight as he gets closer and closer to defeat. After taking thousands of points of damage, Porky's device begins to fail, powering down and slumping to the ground sadly. Porky reiterates that he'll never die, he'll never be beaten. He moves into his absolutely safe capsule, a device that can never be damaged, ensuring his survival. The battle continues, and you try to attack it, but no damage is inflicted. It's absolutely safe. The battle ends with no winner. You gain no XP for the fight. Dr. Andonuts, who made the device, enters the clearing. He reassures us that it is absolutely safe, 
but that it can never be left. Porky is stuck in this capsule forever. At this point, the doctor just rolls him around. It's one of the few moments of levity in the last couple of hours, but it works so well. Seeing this despicable person, who thought he got the better of you, being reduced to a big ball being rolled around joyfully, it's super satisfying. It's the end that Porky deserves. With Porky dealt with, Lucas and the others head to the final needle. You'll soon come to a save frog. After you save, it mentions that's the final frog in the game. It thanks you for saving with it and the others, and cries. When this happened on my first playthrough, I got legitimately emotional. It was sad. I wasn't going to be able to see any more goofy iterations of these fellas. I developed an emotional connection to the concept of saving, just like I said I would right at the start of the video. Man, this game is fucking great! The party, now fully healed, continues to walk through this eerie environment. Not long after, they find the masked man, Klaus, kneeling next to the final needle. He's not pulled it, possibly waiting for Lucas. Klaus senses his brother and turns to face him. In each encounter with the masked man, he and Lucas will have some sort of connection, the screen draining of colour to emphasise it. This implies that the masked man does have some innate sense or memory of Lucas. Klaus has never been completely gone. He shoots lightning at the party again, knocking out everyone but Lucas. It seems like Klaus is purposefully causing the battle to be between him and his brother. The fight starts. The tone is set for this battle right as it begins. There's no epic music, it's atmospheric and personal. It feels important but understated. Lucas is the only one still standing at the beginning of the fight. You can revive other party members, but it will only be a waste of items and PP. This fight is just between Lucas and Klaus. With only Lucas fighting, you can't balance healing and attacking, Klaus's moves being too strong to ignore. This highlights how much other people have helped Lucas, how he's not gotten here by just his own merits. Collaboration and community was essential to the success of his journey. In contrast, it shows how their motivations and processes led them down different paths. Klaus vowed to become stronger, seeking physical power and strength, motivated by revenge. This causes him to achieve that power at the expense of his own well-being, his own free will. Lucas, on the other hand, mourned, using his strength to help others, to heal instead of hurt. This path causes him to be helped in return, finding allies along the way. Klaus can cast PK Love, a move known by just him and Lucas. It deals almost 600 damage, assuredly proving fatal. To make the most of your PP, the best strategy is to guard, which makes the HP ticker count down slower. After doing this for a few turns, a peaceful tune fades in, and we hear someone call Lucas's name. The battle proceeds for a few more turns, until being interrupted again. This same voice is now calling out to Klaus. It's Hanawa, trying to reach her two children. Klaus simply ignores it. Lucas keeps guarding, choosing not to attack his brother. Hinawa calls again, begging Klaus to stop. She sounds desperate. As she speaks, the background of the battle changes, shaking and buzzing like static. The walls that have been built in Klaus's mind are starting to crack. This battle and how it subverts the battle system while staying true to Lucas's characterization, it's genius. You don't just see all this happen, you're a part of it. The masked man has done horrible things, but you don't want to attack him. You understand his journey and the way he's been manipulated. Having to avoid attacking could be frustrating for some players, but we've been so well enraptured by the story and characters that it just makes sense. This is also where the simplicity of the writing shines. There's only short, simple appeals to the human mind, but it drops with emotion. It just feels right. After hanging on a little longer, Klaus casts PK Love again. 
This time, however, Flint jumps in front of Lucas, taking the brunt of the attack instead. Flint tries to appeal to Klaus as well, attempting to reach his son. There's a short pause, and then he casts PK Love again. This moment is intense. You want this family to feel whole again, but it all seems so unlikely now. Klaus soon uses PK Love again, this time a weaker version. It gives us hope. Is Klaus somehow shining through, feeling guilty for what he's doing? Hinawa calls to him again, and he seems to respond. The background pulses slower, now waving in sweeping motions. He seems calmed by Hinawa's voice. She continues to call in desperation and we soon see a flashback. Lucas and Klaus are babies, two brothers with an immense connection. This connection is consistent to the point where the two names are anagrams for the other. The process of Klaus returning to himself, it shows us the importance of optimism and courage in the face of loss. Although the comments on consumerism and greed may seem bleak, to escape those things you have to keep fighting, staying positive and believing in yourself and others. And this testament to optimism is central to Mother 3. The game has this innocence about it, so to promote the importance of a positive outlook makes sense for the game. It's another part of the balancing act, one that is relevant to the game and the player. Fading back to the battle, the music has changed. It plays the same melody that's heard when Hinawa calls out. Her voice is being heard by Klaus, at least on some level. At this point, only Lucas is in the battle, no party members can be revived. It can only be the two of you. By now, Klaus's attacks are weak and restrained. He stares at Lucas, covering his ears. The melody begins to sound more familiar, turning back into the tune we remember it from, as though it's becoming more clear in Klaus's head. He presses his eyes shut, one part of him trying to ignore what's happening. Lucas wants to cry, seeing the masked man fade and his brother come back into view. At this point I honestly feel exactly the same way. <laughs> this battle takes its time, giving the different stages room to breathe. It feels like you're watching this family come back together. All the work the game's put into this world and characters, it's paying off right now. When Hinawa speaks again, she sounds full of love. She just wants to help Klaus rest. The masked man looks around, eventually taking his mask off, discarding what he was forced to be and becoming Klaus once again. The most shocking thing here is how young he looks. You kind of forget that he's a child and seeing it after this long it's just heartbreaking. He fires off one more bolt of lightning, knowing that Lucas's Franklin badge will reflect it back at him. It does just that, mortally wounding Klaus and ending the battle. He falls into Lucas's arms. They're truly remembering each other for the first time in years. Klaus speaks, apologizing for how things turned out, but being thankful that they could be together for the end. He apologizes to Flint as well, stating that he's going to where Hinawa is now. Klaus hopes that he and Lucas meet again and says goodbye, taking his final breath in Lucas's embrace. Okay, now we can cry. I think the game has earned it. Flint reassures Lucas, asking him to pull the last needle and impart his heart onto it, so that we can make the dragon our friend. You, the player, press the button, and Lucas pulls it. 
The earth shakes and we see as all the life on the Noir Islands panics. As meteors fall from the sky, infernos ravage the plant life, and cyclones pulse over the ground. All the places we've been start to crumble, pulling themselves apart at the seams, undoing all life on the islands. The mother pork ship attempts to fly off, being struck in the process and falling to the ground. Even with all the progress Porky and the Pigmas made, it's not enough to escape the natural order of life. The immense power of the Dark Dragon. As we watch the world end, it's bittersweet. We did the right thing, but we can only hope the people we met along the way are okay, because we really cared for them. Or will we find out that they're okay? This ending screen can actually be walked around. As the player, we have control over the ending. Perhaps on some small level, we were this dragon with immense power, playing with this world like it was nothing. The fate of the Nowhere Islands rests in our hands, as we will each tell this story differently, talking about Mother 3 as a game and starting this world anew for others under our jurisdiction. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm retelling this story and, in some way, birthing this world in your minds as well. Thanks to how the game has taken the time to make us care for these characters, it's most likely that we'll speak positively of it, passing on Lucas's good heart to the people of the islands, recreating their world in a positive light. As you walk around, you'll bump into characters from the game, the people of Tasmili, of the White Ship. They're still alive. It's such a relief. The dragon spared them all. These people that entertained you, made you care about them. They're okay. And it makes sense. Mother 3 is an optimistic game. In the face of all the evil Porky imparted onto this world, you still came out on top. Reuniting your family one last time, and undoing all Porky's so-called progress. As you continue to talk to people, someone will eventually ask if you're blank. They will mention you, the player, by name. That random time where you were asked to enter your name in the factory has come back around. In this ending, you're not playing as Lucas, but yourself. This could possibly mean that we were the concept of fate, helping Lucas and the others, causing them to fulfill their roles and play their part, causing them to take the journey that was set out by them by the developers, in a sense. I like how ambiguous this is. There's no concrete answer in the game and I'm just speculating, but the player's importance is stressed and you become a part of this world. Characters think you personally by name. Because of the connections we've forged with these characters, these thank yous actually mean something. While walking around, you'll come across something rolling on the ground with something else inside it. It appears that Porky survived, but he still sits in the absolutely safe capsule, completely useless, reduced to nothing. You'll also pick up the doorknob from Lucas's house, Previously, Lucas couldn't pick it up, this item that would allow him to take control of fate, opening the doors of life himself. But you can pick it up. Like I said earlier, maybe the player was the dictator of fate in a sense, so they controls which doors this world walks through. The people of the Noa Islands bid you farewell, thanking you for all you've done. We're then treated to a credit sequence, but not of the developers, rather the characters of the game. Mother 3 manages to shift tone seamlessly during its ending. Defeating Porky is triumphant. Fighting Klaus is poignant but tragic. Seeing the world end is bittersweet. And seeing the characters safe, and talking to them, it's relieving. It puts a smile on your face. Then you get to reminisce over them all as they scroll past, feeling celebratory. It moves through these moods while giving them enough time to feel fleshed out. It feels appropriately final and represents the game really well.
Then we get to see the staff credits. These people all work together to create something amazing. I'm grateful for all of them and the world that they built, the characters they gave life to and the things that they told us along the way. That also goes for those that worked on the fan translation, making it possible for me to play one of my favourite games of all time. I know I've gone on and on, but I truly believe Mother 3 is a game worth analysing this much. If you managed to stick through this whole video and what I had to say, then thanks. I know it's not perfect, but finally being able to express my feelings and perspective about this game, it's been really satisfying. The final thing we see is the Mother 3 logo, now free from the technology that Porky forced upon it, and an Earth making up the O. This world is free from Porky's influence, free to flourish again. Thanks for watching. like fire hydrants, taxis, and sentinel- Fuck. In 1981, he co-authored a collection of short stories with Haruki Mark <laughs> Sitaro Iwata, and Shigeru- Shigeru Miyamoto. Shigeru Miyamoto. General information about the game, and finally, a letter from Shigeru- Fuck, man. <laughs> so you insert the totally legit mother- Fucking hell, man. <laughs> a minute in. So despite the fact that Klaus appears to be writing a new word of his death with- <laughs> Seeing a carrying- <laughs> It's not a carrying pigeon, it's a carrier pigeon. The battles are simple and quite easy, so you can get used to the fr- Frithum. What's that? He does all of this despite his limp, which makes contributing in these- <sighs> My god. That being said, this combo system isn't a necessary. <laughs> what was that? This may rub some people the long way. <laughs> not the long way. I think this is one of the best ways Mother 3 subverts John Yatra- I think this is one of the best way Mo I think this is one of the best ways Mother 3 subverts John tropes. I think this is one of the best ways that Mother 3 subverts John Yatra- Genre- Gen- Genre- Fuck, it doesn't sound like a word anymore. I said it too much. This expression of power puts into perspective how the pig mask and King Por- Fuck, it's not King Porky yet. You don't know that yet. A chauffeur- A chauffeur- Chauffeur. Chauffeur, that doesn't sound right. Chauffeur, that's it. <laughs> it's not chauffeur. Chauffeur. If you refuse to enter the limo, the chauffeur in Chauffeur, not chauffeur. <laughs> god damn it. Lucas wants to cry. Oh god. Stares into your soul.